part of it. Also, just to indicate that there are a number of dormant uh, organizations that are, will come into fruition as and when the group uh, grows and achieve, achieves its mandate. That's just in the form of a recap. That's the, the ODT in its entirety that comprised uh, this whole audit. Chairperson, uh, just to recap from where we left off, we just don't want to talk about what happened in the current year and then just leave it there. The way we approach our audits really, we, we start from where we left off in terms of what we recommended in the past and compare with what we found in the current environment and really that's the beginning of a conversation as to how come the previous recommendations to which all, uh, both all of us have signed on, how come they're still recurring, what is it that, we can, that can be done differently. In the prior year, we had agreed uh, together with management that uh, there will be a commitment to, to monitor progress on the implementation of the audit action plans that, were, uh, uh, that came from the last year's uh, review. Uh, secondly, we agreed that we'll follow up with the entities that incurred the irregular, fruitless and wasteful expenditure that I'm sure all of us uh, would like to see uh, uh, done away with and whether, if they persist, where they, uh, 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 will there be uh, effective consequence management that's implemented through the structures within the group to effectively deal with the, these uh, undesirable expenditures. And uh, lastly, we, commit, uh, there was a, we recommended that there should be follow-up on processes that are put in place to address the material irregularities that we had lifted in the environment and it, those that led uh, that required consequence management, we take stock of what happened to consequence management if it didn't, if it didn't okay, what were the stumbling blocks. Having put the, uh, the context of recommendations on the right, we both reflect on what was achieved because our focus is not only what went wrong. We also give, we also give and acknowledge efforts uh, that are implemented because we also understand not, it's not, not everything is that easy. So, so some of the issues are quite challenging and we understand and look in the context of the issues, but really, really from our side, we want to see action. If, if things take long, however, there's, there's efforts and action and things are in progress, we do give management a credit and an acknowledgement of the efforts, but really, really we want to see traction in terms of what has been agreed. And, and what is it that you can jointly do to unblock the blockages? In the current year, Chairperson, we are seeing action plans are not adequately monitored, implemented as agreed, and we would like to see effort and resources being put in, in this part because we spoke about it last year. Uh, it's still manifesting in the year under review we would like to see really more being done in that environment. We are saying uh, uh, we are still recommending financial and performance reports. We are saying we're, we're adequately supported and evidence, as evidenced by reliable and accurate information. That is a very encouraging uh, observation. We are very pleased that management didn't not management did not do nothing about it. And uh, we are very, uh, 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 supportive about that achievement. Then, unfortunately, we are saying there was limited evidence of consequence management, uh, limited to the mine. And you will see as the presentation progresses, there's, there's an acknowledgement that there were gaps largely in the mine that led to the overall group being presented the way it is. But I also want to a pause here to say it, it may sound like the it may sound like there's too many things at the mind but I'm also encouraged by the engagements that we had with the mind jointly to develop a refreshed joint action plans uh, that we co-developed to see to it that next year we are not going to be having the same conversations uh, around what we saw at the mine, and I'm very, very, very encouraged uh, that there was, there was a, a, a commitment jointly, and the, the initiatives were developed 
the initiatives were signed off and they are going to be appropriately resourced at the mine so that it lifts the whole group to get back to uh, the, the, uh, to get back to avoid the regression that is underpinning the whole presentation uh, 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 for the group. We are acknowledging that uh, there was progress made in resolving the material irregularities. Challenging as it was, it is a significant step forward that we have noticed, uh, uh, particularly at Petro SA. We want to commend management on that. And although some, there are still some struggles with the achievement of uh, some of the indicators related to the <coughs> core mandate, but uh, there, there's a reason why we use the word some there, because we acknowledge that efforts and uh, uh, work was achieved in other areas related to the key uh, achievement of key performance indicators. As I said, the regret in the audit outcomes at the group and the mine, we believe that it's something that can be reversed uh, if we can direct most of our efforts at the mine so that the group does not get affected by the, you know, by the negative out, uh, overall audit outcomes. Chairperson, we share with the, the committee a, a, a high-level overview of the, what, what, the subsets of what make up the regression. I've already indicated the mine unfortunately went into a disclaimer, which is uh, the, probably the worst audit outcome, and hence the depth and the breadth of the issues at the mine resulted in the reversal of the group as a whole. I would like to maybe uh, focus on the reasons for the regression, which is the block at the bottom in the middle on the left. The heading there says regressions, reasons for the regressions. Just to dig a little bit deeper in that area to say there was an inadequate system for identifying and disclosing irregular expenditure in the financial statements. Uh, which had a significant impact at group level. Uh, there were inadequate reviews of the financial statements against the underlying schedules that were provided to us. Uh, inadequate uh, record keeping which needed to be provided to support the information that's recorded in the systems. That is something that I do believe it's a, it's a low hanging fruit to reverse and address. Uh, and lastly, the inadequate processes over monitoring and review of the as I indicated of the of the action plans that were pre that were pre agreed. The rest of the items I've already touched on. I just wanted to put the spotlight on the reasons for the regression, especially because of the man. You can go to the next slide. This is a also a ref, it's a sort of a, a different view of the components of the contributors to the regression. It talks to the same slide that we uh, spoke to before, but maybe it's, it's slightly, it's a slightly different version on the disclaimed the mind from the bottom up, qualified is the group itself, and then what makes up the category of unqualified is those uh, five entities. We would like to see and unqualified with no findings next year when we convene a uh, chairperson. Now we go, do you want to talk? I'll hand over to my colleague to talk a little bit more in depth on the subsets of our audit uh, uh, components to give members a, a, a more nuanced view of the, the components that contributed to the regression. Dim San is going to talk, chairperson. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Ramanzi. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, for, for the opportunity. I, I just want to also start in this particular slide and, and to, to really emphasize a couple of points. The, the first point I want to emphasize, uh, Chairperson, is to draw the attention uh, of the committee and yourself on the audit outcome for SEF as a separate holding company. 
So SAF as a separate holding company did obtain an unqualified, but the consequential impact of African exploration mining, who then led to the overall regression uh, for the group, which then landed in the qualified audit space. Chairperson, just to proceed with the presentation, we look at the three areas, um, namely the first one being the financial statements, the second one being the performance report, as well as the third one being the compliance with the key legislation. What you see uh, in the graphics there on the left uh, is a reflection on the quality of performance reports uh, across the group. So we've seen that um, 33% of the entities within the group submitted annual performance reports that were credible uh, without material misstatements, and 67% had material misstatements. Um, all four of the entities were allowed to make corrections to their annual performance report, and you then see the picture that we are seeing on the right. No reliability findings were reported in the audit report, however, this is mainly due to the entities having to also work with the auditors during the audit process. And I must emphasize, Chairperson, uh, this is allowed in the auditing process itself. And I think the key message here uh, is that we are placing a lot of value and emphasis in the responsiveness of the entities to attend to the issues that would have been raised by the AGSA so that there is no repeat of these matters going forward. And the responsiveness that we've seen uh, is a positive response, a response coming through from the different subsidiary entities as well as the self group. Performance against the target, uh, Chairperson. So this picture really reflects uh, on the key targets within the self group. So towards the left, on the far left, uh, at the self SOC level, We've seen that the entity uh, would have um, achieved 85% of its key target, uh, with only 15% that was not achieved. Petro SA, uh, 48% versus 52%. SFF, 41% versus 59%. PASA, 84% versus 16%. African exploration, 19% versus 81%, and I guess 58% for, uh, versus 42 And the overall message is that despite the inconsistent achievement of targets, the group has improved in relation to the execution of their mandate when looking at the increasing level of closed investments over the past two years. Uh, that is the acquisition, like the Aqua projects, the Remco. However, we He's saying more attention is still required to ensure that the indicators at the group and at the holding company level are also useful. So this is a message that we're sharing. We've seen that uh, from a self point of view, uh, there's been achievements, uh, there's been an improvement in terms of the, the mandate, the execution of the mandate uh, within the group itself. Financial management and compliance chair, um, here we reflect on the status of financial management controls. We look at the proper record keeping disciplines, daily and monthly rec uh, recording controls, in year and end year reporting processes, as well as co a review uh, of and monitoring of compliance with the applicable laws and legislation. Across the group, uh, Chair, we've seen that um, if I focus your attention to the box at the bottom, um, we saw that uh, in, within the group itself, there was no ODT or no subsidiary submitted financial statements that did not have corrections being made by the auditors. 71% uh, being five of auditees submitted financial statements that contained material misstatements that were subsequently adjusted. And this was mainly due to the inadequate reviews. All entities uh, relied on the audit process to ensure that the annual financial statements are credible and free from material misstatements. And really, the root cause for the poor quality of Fs uh, is inadequate reviews of Fs to ensure that they are adequately supported and they are in compliance with the IFRS standard. But I must also indicate that 
the positive responsiveness that we have seen again from the leadership of the entities is the one that says they are going to attend to this particular issue from an internal control point of view so that going forward um, the, the overall status within the group itself uh, is actually improved. My colleague spoke to the African exploration and I will focus a little bit on it. Um, the second bullet point on the, gray, on the orange block box that I'm talking to. So at African Exploration Mining, uh, audits of annual financial statements regressed to a disclaimer. Um, and this disclaimer was due to a significant number of material limitations um, uh, compared to disagreements as sufficient and appropriate audit evidence was not provided. The root cause for the regression is mostly inadequate um, uh, capacitation at critical functions within the entity and adequate implementation and monitoring of action plans to address prior findings and related weaknesses in internal control. Uh, Chairperson, we have been in conversations with the management at the entity, uh, and we are encouraged by the responsiveness. Um, um, we've been taken into confidence in terms of the action plans that they've put into place. Uh, we have also set um, uh, with management ourselves so that we can co-create uh, an action plan that will address the issues that we've identified as the audit office in so far as African exploration is concerned. So the overall message is although we saw a regression, but the responsiveness uh, is quite encouraging. The, the main qualification areas as it relates to African exploration uh, is the irregular expenditure. And Chair, if I may just also spend a little bit of time on this one. So the consequential impact at the group level was as a result of the irregular expenditure uh, in a sense that at the African exploration level, the audit team um, had challenges in so far as verifying the completeness of irregular expenditure as well as limitations that were experienced and as a result um, the group opinion was subsequently affected. The other elements which um, are listed underneath, although material at a subsidiary level, did not um, affect the overall opinion at the group level. Just to quickly go through some of those, trade and other payables, there was a limitation. Investment in, associ in associates, a disagreement with management. Cash flow statement, a disagreement. Um, contingent liabilities, limitations, and hence, our view as the audit office is with management having taken on board these matters that we've raised and management having committed to address these matters, um, we see the situation improving and we also want to acknowledge that from an oversight point of view, uh, there has been strong commitment to also deal with these particular issues. Key recommendations, effective implementation and monitoring of audit action plans to address prior findings where material misstatements were identified. In-depth review of financial statements to ensure uh, that the reporting uh, complies with the relevant standards. Implementation of daily and monthly and accounting accounting and financial disciplines, including the preventative control. So the emphasis is really uh, on the preventative nature of these controls. Adequate capacitation of critical functions within the entities, such as the filling of vacancies uh, and the continuous training. And I'm aware that some of these matters have already been attended to. Chair, at the high level, just to also reflect on the financial health uh, within the group, um, we see that within the group in so far is that revenue parts is, is, is concerned. Um, only one entity being us, being PASA, where we saw that the average debt collection period is 66 days, and we are reflecting on the root causes uh, on the expenditure side. Across the group, the fruitless and wasteful expenditure is 6.84 million. Credit payment, which exceeds 30 days, uh, Petro SA, African Exploration, PASA, SFF, and SEF, and creditors that uh, greater than available cash, and that was only at Petro SA uh, as well as PASA. And the average credit period uh, is then 64 days. On the right, we reflect on the impact uh, of the financial health 
um, uh, uh, observations that we've made on the left. And really from our side, we continue to emphasize that when one sits back and look at the group uh, holistically, um, there's no doubt that these auditors can continue as a going concern. Uh, we are just elevating these risks that we believe management should pay attention to going forward. Uh, I won't talk to this particular slide, Chairperson. Uh, this is the slide that supports the previous overall messages uh, from our side. Really here, we look at the current asset positions of the different entities, the cash that is available, as well as the creditors. Suffice to say, if you look at the self, um, uh, self SOC level, um, there is a positive current asset uh, of about 29 million, uh, cash about um, uh, Cash of about 3.2 billion um, creditors. Uh, apologies, Chair. Cash of about 4.5 and creditors of about 3.2 billion. So overall, um, the state of the self SOC uh, is quite good and is underpinned by the previous message which I shared with you, with yourselves in the previous slide. Compliance with laws and regulations, Chair. Um, this then talks to the different compliance areas that we look at starting from a strategic planning, quality of financial statements, prevention of irregular and fruitless and wasteful expenditure, oversight and governance, procurement and contract management, as well as consequence management. They would see that within the group, there are uh, findings that we are having. Others, there has been an improvement in one or two areas, but this is an area that we continue to flag from our side uh, in terms of uh, it needing to be, to be achieved, to be attended to going forward. So overall, uh, top right, uh, we're saying there's an overall improvement on compliance within the group. Um, and this was evidenced by the reduced number of non-compliance instances. So really the detail at the bottom then talks to the status um, at a particular point in time, but there is an acknowledgement that there has been an improvement uh, within the group. Bottom left, we're reflecting on the root causes. Uh, I think some of these root causes I would have spoken to. Then on the right, um, I think I've also covered some of the recommendations uh, talking to this particular area. Procurement and payment, um, uh, with the procurement and payments within the group in compliance with the necessary legislation, we saw that at I guess uh, there were no findings uh, at SEF, Petro SA, PASA, and SFF. Uh, there were findings, and then of course uh, the material finding would have been at African exploration uh, uh, mining. Uh, and at the bottom, at the, in the middle there, we're reflecting on. Um, the different findings um, as they relate to the different entities. So uncompetitive and unfair procurement processes would have seen at so itself, African Exploration, Petro SA, PASA, and SFF uh, prohibited awards we saw uh, at African Exploration, prohibited awards to other state officials at African Exploration, and limitations on the audit work at African Exploration. So some of the subsidiaries, um, including the CEFSOC, would not have had those particular findings. Irregular expenditure chair, um, we've seen that within the group, um, compared to last year, there has been an increase and that increase really is as a result of the SFF, uh, irregular expenditure that we've included uh, in, the, in the current year. And really from a root cause point of view, lack of proper discipline and compliance in monitoring uh, by management within the SEM units, improper delegation of powers uh, when entering into contracts, uh, compliance not monitored to identify and prevent instances of procurement processes not being followed, and on the right, we're reflecting on the recommendations from our side, which really talks to the implementation of daily and monthly procurement and contract management disciplines and adequate reviews within the procurement processes to ensure that contracts uh, are entered into um, by the appropriately delegated officials. But as I said, the Chair, uh, this issue is then mainly isolated uh, to, to a particular subsidiary. Just to reflect on consequence management as it relates to prior year irregular expenditure chairperson, uh, we've seen that uh, insofar as the opening irregular expenditure, um, there, there has been 
progress towards attending to the opening balance of regular expenditure, but would really call upon for a more heightened level in terms of dealing with the prior irregular expenditure. The figure at the bottom really talks to the fact that insofar as, of course, after having gone through the normal processes as per the Act, um, uh, we have not seen any regular expenditure being condoned or removed, um, written off, uh, but of course this will, these steps will be informed uh, after the necessary processes would have been undertaken by management. Material irregularities. The positive message here, Chair, um, which is a factual one, is that within the group we only have one, one material irregularity. Uh, as my colleague indicated, this is a space that we really would want to avoid at all cost, and, and, and we've also acknowledged that even with that particular uh, material irregularity, we are seeing that there is a positive um, uh, progress that has been made in dealing with that particular material irregularity. So the overall message is we're not seeing a lot of material irregularities, we're only having one, and in that regard there is a positive uh, progress that has been made. So in conclusion, Chair, to summarize the, the presentation, at the key root causes level, inadequate reviews of financial statements, compliance with key legislation, inadequate uh, implementation and monitoring of audit action plans, slow progress in implementing consequence management, and I think I've spent a lot of time in terms of the key recommendations. And really the overall message, I think, throughout the presentation, Chairperson and members, uh, I would have spoken to some of these different elements. Chairperson, that concludes the presentation from our side uh, with the message that says, although there is a regression at the group level, uh, we have seen um, uh, the overall improvement in certain key aspects uh, within the self-group itself, uh, and we remain encouraged by the positive nature and manner in which the leadership at the, at the different entities have really responded to the audit findings. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, Chairperson, just in conclusion, a second aspect of the portfolio committee's ask was to articulate the reason for the delay of the audit. Uh, in our view, there was nothing untoward. Um, management has got a prerogative to raise queries which are embedded in part of our audits. We uh, have to afford management an opportunity to provide information that which they believe is sufficient. Uh, and if, it's, if they believe that the audit outcome is not a true reflection of the activities of the group, we have a process within the our audit methodology that deals with the audit dispute process. And as I indicated, uh, management has to ventilate, provide additional information that we may have inadvertently not considered to address the matters that are of concern to management. I would like to give the portfolio committee comfort that there was nothing really uh, wrong or untoward with what is seen as a delay. Both parties needed to satisfy themselves fully that the audit outcome reflects the true state of affairs of the organization. And I'm glad to, to be uh, uh, sharing with the portfolio that please rest assured that the audit was handled fairly, objectively, and both parties are fully satisfied with the outcome of the audit. I wish to thank you, Chairperson. Okay. Bye, Danke. Uh, Adumkwat, any take from just on the audit side of the report from the AG before I go to members? No, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members. Uh, fortunately, I've been kept engaged on the audit process by the team. Our team, not by the AG. <laughs> I've been kept engaged by the team, all the steps. One area that I think on our part we must pay attention is the last item raised, that uh, late submission of financial statements is not a good sign. We must attend to that. There may be sound reasons, but it is not a good sign. We must try to act on time, 
submit our financial statements on time, get them audited on time. I would have preferred if it was said, you no, know, we submitted them, but the audit delayed it. Uh, that is not the, the statement. If it's the, that's not the statement, I think there's something that needs to be attended. The second thing that I think is needing attention uh, is the increase on irregular expenditure. Uh, that is not uh, expected from a, an entity like SAF as a group. Uh, it happens from time to time, but I was more worried about the level of, compl of compliance. You know, uh, in terms of achieving targets, uh, SAF as a group uh, achieved 85% of targets. Uh, PASA achieved 84% of the targets. That is good performance. But you have uh, AE that is getting 19% of the targets. And it gets disclaimer. And I think as a group, uh, as the chairman and CE, we'll have to pay attention to AE much closer. Because uh, if you only achieve 19% of your targets and you end up with a, a disclaimer, uh, there is something that needs attention. But we must also acknowledge the fact that there was no CFO there. Uh, CFO was employed quite late uh, in the term. And there's direct impact on the performance of the entity itself. Um, of the unchanged uh, audit results of unqualified with findings, uh, we can have a number of them moving to clean audits. That is the intention of our department. But in brief, Chairperson, I must make the point that um, this is an area where we are actually doing a lot of building work. We are building the entities. Uh, it is not just operational. Uh, let me take just two as examples. AE, for example, for a long time was not run as a mining entity. Only now that we are trying to make it a mining entity, we are trying to look into mining skills into it. Uh, in a long term, that it was not. Uh, we are serious about it. It must be a mining company, state-owned mining company. It must perform uh, to the requirements of a mining company. We are quite comfortable with the work being done there, but we think it can be accelerated. Petro SA, you are rebuilding it. Uh, it was collapsed totally to nothing. Uh, we are rebuilding it. It has done well on the trading side. We must revive the refining capacity of Petro SA. If we succeed in that, everything will look much better. Uh, our view is that it's an area, a e group of companies, it's an area of work where we're building. Uh, SFF, IE, Petro SA are going to be merged to form the South African National Petroleum Company. That is building work we're busy with. Uh, it's going to be quite complicated, it's going to be complex, there's going to be a lot of resistance. Uh, there are quite a, a number of visible interests that tempered with the work we do in this area. And that is my comment. I'm happy with the AG's work. Uh, my, my appeal is that in areas where there are serious weaknesses, AG must engage us on an ongoing basis. Because our view is that uh, AG is not there to find faults, it is there to facilitate improvements and work in the department. And, and we are committed to work with them on that. Thank you very much. Honourable members, um, let me take Honourable Masaule, Honourable Mailem, Honourable Malenga, Enekhaande. Okay. Um, I, I, I know it's complicated, Honourable members. I will just request we just focus only on the audit outcomes uh, of the AG. I was doing this so that we also have in mind 
what is the take of the department on the audit outcomes. Honorable Masawle. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and greetings to yourself, uh, members, and uh, the minister, and his team. Uh, and the leadership of uh, AGSA. Uh, I just want to first welcome the presentation and uh, acknowledge your acknowledgement that uh, indeed from 2019 to now we are seeing a different uh, Central Energy Fund with its subsidiaries and um, we are registering some progress, which is a good uh, positive. I just have one issue, Chair, which I'm not going to hold back the punches on. You see, here is AG and uh, SEF going back and forth since 2021 on audit reports because they want to satisfy each other um, on financial statements. AG wants to comply. Uh, SEF wants to meet their compliance. But I think they are selfish in their, their work because they forget that there's a third party, which is Parliament, which has a responsibility to do oversight as well in terms of the BRRR. For two years, we have not... Uh, uh, dealt with BRRRs that are uh, involving SEF. And to the public that we represent, it looks like Parliament is failing to discharge its duties. And that's why I call it selfish from your behavior, the two entities, AGSA and SEF. And I want to, to plead that uh, moving forward, have timelines on what, uh, 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 on how long you do back and forth and refuse and reviews of uh, the financial statements that uh, consider it that we 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 too have got the responsibility to to d discharge our our duties as parliament. So your back and forth can be for a year and uh, limit us in discharging our our responsibilities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairperson. Good morning to everybody. Um, I firstly want to concur 100% with what my colleague has just said about the lateness of the reports and the impact it has on Parliament conducting its duties uh, with regard to BRRRs and annual performance plans and holding the Minister and the Department and the entities to account. So I firstly want to concur completely with what he said. I want to focus um, well, let me start by, by drawing attention to slide 15 and 16, if I may. On slide 15, <coughs> um, it's about halfway down the slide, you'll see that there are no reference made under procurement and contract management to CEF, SOC, IGAS, Petros, A, SFF, PASA. Um, and as, as these being areas of non-compliance. But if you go over the page to slide 16, the very first line of that and the heading is procurement and payments, we see uncompetitive and unfair procurement processes. And there they are, CEF, African Exploration, Petro SA, PASA, SFF. So I'd, I'd really like the AG if you wouldn't mind explaining how we can, on one slide, say that there are problems, and on the other slide, on slide 15, say, no, no, these aren't really material problems. Um, and I think that, that that needs to be clarified. Um, then if we could go to slide 19. On this slide, we're looking at dealing with irregular expenditure. And if you have a look, the irregular expenditure goes back to 2019, 2020. In fact, it goes back further than that, but that's, that's far enough for the purposes of what we're looking at here. 574 million in 2019, 20, 855 in 2021, 1.17 in 21, 22, and 4.2 billion in 22, 23. And then we look at what has been done about it 
And the answer is nothing. The answer is no money has been recovered, no money has been written off, no money has been condoned. So essentially we're left with this irregular expenditure that's brushed aside and ignored. And that's a huge problem for me. I, I acknowledge point two on, on the right hand side that says investigations are in process, but they're always in process. They're never resolved. There's never any action. And this is where I believe the AG now needs to use the teeth that have been included in the Auditor General's uh, founding legislation. You've been given teeth to, to, to take action where there is non-compliance. I really would like to see the AG taking action in that regard. If we could then go to slide 21. On slide 21 it says, a material irregularity at Petrose of 11.5 million, sale of diesel to a fictitious supplier. And this just raises alarm bells all the way through my head. Because how on earth do you sell 11.5 million rands worth of diesel to a fictitious supplier? How is it possible that there is no paper trail, no vetting, no, is this person a legitimate dealer, are they not? And it brings me to a current situation. In last, uh, at the end of last year, Petro SA entered into a contract with Equator Holdings. And a cursory check of, of that entity would have revealed that this is not a company that has a track record in the sector. It's not a company that can put up guarantees. It's not a company that has uh, credible stakeholders. In fact, the key stakeholder of that company is quite dodgy. So Minister, I have to ask what's happening and I have to ask the AG why these issues are being allowed to slip through the cracks. My last question, and it relates specifically to diesel contracts, is why are these diesel contracts not being referred to National Treasury's Chief Procurement Officer? Why are they not being reviewed by the Chief Procurement Officer at Treasury? And what is the AG doing to monitor that process, compliance with that process? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Greetings to yourself, members of the Portfolio Committee, the Minister, um, the Department, and all uh, captains of industries and our staff. Chairperson, let me welcome the presentation by the AG and safely say that some of the points that I wanted to start with are already, have already been asked by my colleagues. Chair, I was also on slide 19 on how to resolve the irregular expenditure, which Honorable Malem has covered. But Chairperson, when it comes to the issue of the targets that were achieved by the entities, I see that the AG says KPIs do not match the targets. And it's not the first time that the, the AG has, has said that in their document. They said that during um, our meeting with them and the department. So maybe we could be clarified. What do they mean about that, Chair? Um, and AG does not require or does not supply the, the consequence management, but on, on the issue of irregular expenditure uh, 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 that were, were done by the, by the entities. But you also raise those issues with the, with the, with the entities. So it's, it does not tally well, Chair. Thank you very much. Okay, before I go uh, to the AG and then uh, the team, DMR, Ibele Gusai FM call. AG, AG. I looked at your report 
Somebody once asked who's policing the police. I look at your report. My assumption is that you seemed to have been given powers, but you are still spending more time on what you were complaining about, not having powers. In your three um, stages of accountability, you seem to be spending more time on influence than in enforcement. Why? I think honorable members have tried to raise this thing. Let's dramatize instead of trying to pit about the bush. The question will be, what is the timeline to submit financials? Now, one will argue and say you are in March now. You are supposed now to be preparing the financials for 2023 expenditure 2024. The AG, I don't want to go, I'm not saying the entity is uh, exempted, but the AG, when we are supposed to be talking about, how do we prepare, if, if it was not the accident of dissolution of parliament at any time from now, how would we plan budgeting if we don't know what has been the expenditure? I know this is a sex schedule too, probably you don't necessarily fall there, but they will still be come, coming here to account. For instance, you are raising issues of non-compliance, especially on the annual targets in terms of performance. How do we approve as a committee, or how do they plan, even them, when they don't know what will be the outcome of the audit results. Because whilst we are still busy trying to influence one another, it seems to me you are not using what you have. Uh, you need to really help us because sitting here would have assumed that you would come here and say they've you know, with all due respect, uh, Chair and the Group C, there's been an experience where the AG would say, we can't even look at the books. <laughs> you see, they never went to and fro. They just said, uh -uh. what do they say? So I'm looking at, at looking at these books, but I can't see them. <clears throat> now, I think you, you need to take us into confidence, AG on this one. And just a clarity on AE, because you wouldn't know at what period, uh, whether is the period, the, the financial year that we are talking about, which is the audit year, or you are now referencing to the current financial year. When you say there was no uh, chief financial officer, because if we look now at the recommendations, it doesn't seem to be saying we are recommending. So I want to get the assumption that is it because when towards the end of the 2022-2023 financials, then they employed towards the end the chief financial officer, or as you were doing the to and fro, they then employed the chief financial officer. And if that is the case, then one would argue and say, it can't then be part of the recommendations for this financial, for that financial year that is being presented now. Help me to understand the period, the moment. Um, is it a period of employment prior May, let me put it like that, 2023? Or is it a period 
after May, when the financial had already been given, when these books were referred to you, where had they already employed the chief financial office? And if not, then it would mean it's just an information sharing ex exercise. It should only reflect on the 2023-2024 financials. <clears throat> My second thing, you know, some of the things, the most, I always say, the most dangerous thing is to be afraid to ask things you don't know, especially when it comes to the AG. The AG in your, what slide is this? Slide four. Just at the end, it, it, on, the, on the right hand side, it says dormant companies and associates have been excluded in this presentation. Please just open our eyes. Uh, because they can be dormant, but they may have an impact. Dormant as, dormant as non functional or dormant as non operational. They are not part of the operations. And uh, one issue again, I can't get an opinion. If you can just unpack more, I see those, uh, you listed those domain companies. If we can get more on the issue of fund management, the equalization fund, can you give us clarity? One, its basis. Two, is it part of what it's supposed to be audited or is to us it's just being shared for us, for our eyes to see? I just, I thought those are the issues. Uh, let me give you then, AG. Uh, Chairperson, thank you very much, as well as the members of the committee with the points for clarification and question. I'll deal with the first one and allow um, my colleagues also to weigh in on some of the specifics. I think I'd like to acknowledge the the concern that was raised by the, the members around commitment to timely completion of the audit is something that I do believe it can be done better. I think on our side, really, uh, we felt that management needed to be afforded an opportunity as part of this dispute process, but the point is well acknowledged that it shouldn't have been um, allowed to take that long, we should have both agreed to put the category in and commit to the closure of the audit. The point is well made and fully, fully uh, accepted. It, I can commit that it's not it's something that will not happen again. On the other matters, I'd like uh, Tolani to address, and we can tick off as we go, not necessarily in order of, if, if that's okay with you, uh, Chairperson. And then at the end, we will confirm if everybody's happy that their matters have been addressed, if that's what, fine with each other. Colin, you want to deal with the specific matters? Thank you, Chief. Um, good morning, honorable members. Um, I'll attempt to deal with a number of um, the issues that have been brought forward. I think maybe if I can start with the one that is currently flighted in relation to domain companies. Um, as you rightfully um, state, Chair, um, um, Honorable Chair, uh, the domain companies um, pretty much in relation or from a significance point of view, there's no much activity that is happening in those. However, still, as much as we have excluded them in the presentation, we do still audit them as part of our audit processes. And um, there were no significant issues that um, needed to be elevated from, from those uh, particular domains. Um, I think maybe also talking to, I mean, if you look at the quantum or the weight of those domains, uh, because the numbers are quite small and in some of the domains, um, 
there's really nothing in there. If you look at the weight of those domains and also even the associates, they're quite small in comparison to the subsidiaries and, and hence why the more focus was on the subsidiaries. I believe if there were significant issues that needed to be highlighted on the domains, um, we would have elevated, but majority of them um, are unqualified chair and currently are sitting um, clean. Um, and then in relation to the equalization fund um, chair, um, the equalization fund, as much as it is administered um, by CEF, it does not fall as part of the CEF group in terms of the relationship of a holding company and subsidiaries. We have audited the equalization fund. I think um, maybe, Chair, going forward, what we might need to do is to include the equalization fund as a separate um, uh, presentation in terms of its outcome. But, but as things stand, um, the equalization fund was also audited and it's currently sitting as clean. <clears throat> so there's no material issues that we identified there. But, but, but we do know, Chair, your comment in relation to the fund and, and we shall then maybe going forward report on it. <clears throat> and then, Chair, in relation to um, the procurement issues, um, that were highlighted in relation to slide, um, the compliance slide and the procurement slide. So if you go to the procurement slide, so or, or maybe let's start with the compliance slide. So the compliance slide, pretty much what it surmises is material non-compliance findings that were issued in the audit. So when you look at the slide, in a nutshell, these would be non-compliance instances that resulted in material findings. However, when you go to the next slide, and then you'll see, <clears throat> I think on the procurement, it's only AE that features um, in terms of having been issued with material findings on compliance. So as much as there were no material findings that we picked up on compliance, uh, we still had findings, um, but based on our assessment um, of the significance or the magnitude of those findings, um, uh, they were not material. And, and, and magnitude can, 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 can mean <clears throat> the size of the contracts or the size of the quotations or the award being below our, our, our threshold, or also, um, like for example, with SEF, um, um, it would be more issues that are legacy and not necessarily um, compliance issues that took place during the audit cycle that we are looking at. So, so in relation to that, so, so in terms of looking at the two slides, um, the correlation between the slide before and this slide is that um, the slide before focuses on material findings and should be read in conjunction with the material aspect of this procurement slide. But, 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 but as indicated, um, um, in relation to the other findings, um, we had assessed them uh, and, and found them not to be material. And hence why they didn't result in a material procurement non-compliance. So that's um, on that. And then in relation to KPIs, uh, Chair, the inconsistency um, versus the aspect of the achievement um, and also the issues that we have highlighted. I think when you look at the issues that we've highlighted, um, Chair, because obviously we wanted to just bring this slide just to reflect on the reported achievements that were made by the respective uh, companies. However, that being the case, this slide must also be read with the slide in relation to the findings that we have raised in, in, uh, in performance information, which I would believe it would be the previous slide. So for example, uh, when you look at CEF or when you look at um, um, PetroSA, because I think CEF, PetroSA and AE are the, the ones that are impacted with the performance information findings. When you look at them, um, 
you must then look at the issues raised in conjunction with the achievements that, that are raised. And obviously, Chair, we, we would have raised the issues specific to an indicator. And obviously, the, the entities would have all other multiple indicators that they would be reporting on. So that's why then you would then need to, to, to read the two in conjunction. And I think when you look at the, the, the main issues coming out of uh, performance information are sitting um, at AE. Uh, you, you go to PetroSA, um, there was I think one target that we had an issue with, and mostly that target was in relation to the subsidiary of PetroSA. When you go to SEF, uh, the main issue that we had there was changes to the corporate plan, whether it be adding um, some targets that were not predetermined or, or approved per the initial approval of the shareholder, or a, a case of you know some targets maybe being excluded. But in terms of the reliability of what has been reported and the populations that we would have audited there, we did not have any issues uh, in relation to that, as you would have seen in the previous slide. So, so I think that the inconsistency it was more just looking at, at, at a group as a whole that some, some entities seem to have performed very well whilst others have performed extremely low and then you have you know, the rest of the pool sitting in the middle. Um, so Chair, um, I think um, uh, Mr. Tlamelo has spoken to the issue of the timelines um, and maybe, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I, I would believe we would have covered everything. Um, okay, maybe you can come in. Thank you. Uh, Chairperson, through you, the issue of the timing of the CFO, the to and fro, the point that the Chairperson raised as to whether we should be, do the issues relate to, are they, substantively relating to the 2023-24 or they deal with the period under review in relation to the timing of the appointment of the CFO, the to and fro? In the main, in relation to the appointment of the CFO, based on our knowledge, the CFO was only appointed after the financial year. So the outcomes that we're presenting here um, is in relation to the year that ended 31st March 2023. So, um, so, so the CFO's appointment is more looking forward, and obviously the outcome in relation to the 2023-24 would be more reflective of, 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 of his appointment and him functioning in that role. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Chair. With your permission again, Chairperson, I wanted to check with Pamela and Zangita if you wanted to weigh in on some of the specifics. Thanks, Chair. Th th thank you very much, uh, Tlamelo. And Honorable Chair, I think um, Tolani has covered the bit around the irregular expenditure as well around the um, uh, Petro SA. I wanted to just weigh in on the matter around um, the enforcement that we had um, at Petro SA and the comment that Honorable Member had around the uh, fictitious suppliers. We found that there was a breakdown in control in the, in the system and the fictitious supply was pretty good at um, covering up. They, they, they mimicked a very well-known company. So I think the controls broke down in the, in, in the petro environment. We issued a material irregularity for that. And where we were at is when we resolved, we were comfortable that management had done the investigation and taken the necessary uh, steps against um, the, the officials that uh, were found um, to not have uh, implemented the system of control. Uh, together with that, we do understand that they are in the process of trying to recover the, the financial loss, which is out of the, the board's hands and now sitting with the necessary uh, authority. I think um, it's uh, definitely an area where um, Petro can, uh, has learned from, from the systems and, and the processes. And if there is any other space in terms of um, vetting of suppliers, um, we understand that the systems have been enhanced. Um, so you do make a reference point to a, another contract that has been entered into. We have commenced the audit of Petro for the new financial year, and that will fall into the scope of the new financial year. Thank you very much.
Uh, Chairperson, uh, in, in, in closing, before we check if everybody has been responded to, I think you raised a, a point of dramatizing um, the MI. I think one needs to be very circumspect in that because it's not a mechanical exercise. We, we weigh the qualitative factors. You look at, we look at management's commitment to addressing the issues, the limitations that they face, and we apply our judgment to it as well. Uh, it, it may look, the outside looking inside may be very impatient, but for us, it's also part of a stakeholder management uh, process weighing all the difficult issues. But all of that really rests on what we can see as management commitment to addressing the issues. And, and it may uh, take a little while for, for the outsiders to see an MI, but that doesn't mean um, it's, a, it's an endless process where you can put timelines and say by the 30th of this day, there must be an MI. No, uh, there, there are, what do you call this, extenuating circumstances that impact on, on, on the timing on when an MI is really being activated. I thought I should just respond to that. Thank you, Chepes. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have a chance to, to make our presentation. And in that process, we'll answer to a number of questions. Only a few issues that I think we should pay attention to. 11 million sale to a fictitious dealer. Uh, I think that question has been asked, but what I think is not appropriate is to attach a company that has nothing to do with that fictitious dealing to the dealing. It's unfortunate. It's a question of rumor mongering that the talks of this company, Quetesa, uh, that has done this and that and that. It is, it has been, it is not the fictitious dealer. What is in the, in the uh, edited financial statement is the fictitious dealer who got a, a 11 point something million uh, sale. So to, to, to drag a company that is not part of it to, to the issue is unfortunate. Now let me let me let me explain this. And the, the, the motivation by Mr. Milam is that they have no track record and so forth. And so forth. Companies that are emerging and developing will have no track record. They will be given exposure. They will develop. They will grow. Others will collapse. And it is the responsibility of the state to manage capital formations post independence. And if the state neglects that responsibility, there will be no development of capital post-independence. So my own view is that it is unfortunate that you drag that company into this question of uh, a fictitious deal. The second one is uh, there is an issue that says diesel conduct must be referred to National Treasury Procurement Team. Uh, you can do that if you want to, but the reality of the matter is that this is an entity, it is running, it is registered, it reports, it is here today to report. Otherwise, you say the National Treasury must come and report here. Because you take their responsibility, give it to National Treasury, because you don't trust them. It can't work that way. Oversight is about enforcing trust on entities that are under your jurisdiction. So I think those two issues are, are something else. The last point, my observation is that uh, the, the, the portfolio committee really doesn't acknowledge progress made. That's my view. Uh, instead, I think they regret progress. Let me give you two examples of that observation on my part. They say, why don't you use your teeth? 
I think the other, the, the other journalists know what they have to. We're not going to chase them and say to them, please bite this and bite that and bite that. We can't do that. They will do what is within their responsibility. But for us to say, use your teeth, is irresponsible of a, an oversight committee. Lastly, uh, you should have written, we can't express a view on the books. That is not the findings are here before us. The worst performance is AE, is a disclaimer. That is not not expressing a view on the books, it's a disclaimer. And we must work on that disclaimer to improve. That's our responsibility, working with the entities. And I think, uh, Chairperson, these issues worry me on the approach as an oversight committee. And wait, Honourable my name. Uh, Honourable members, relax, Minister. <laughs> you are coming to the presentation by self. Let me start there. For an example, the issues that relate to, that's why I said we wanted to give the AG so that if there are issues that are emerging and relate to SAF. SAF must be able to respond, obviously, through the department. When they have responded, then we give honorable members. Now, rest assured, the committee has not made an opinion. We will deal with whether there is progress or not when we have received the presentation from SAF. So we express no opinion. The point, though, we're raising, that's why we're not referring to SAF. We're referring to AG. That is subject to how do we understand each other. The point we're raising is that you've got an entity, independent entity of the state that is supposed to for instance, one example that AG says, they said in the to and fro between themselves, and they realized that they could not reverse that decision. And therefore, we said, create a balance between the responsibility of the committee to do oversight and your responsibility to manage your differences or misunderstanding. So we have not made, I want to request honorable members that the issues that relate to SAF, including the one honorable members, please, honorable Mailem, let's allow then SAF to present, respond, because for me, the issue with regards to the fictitious company vis-a-vis, -vis, yes, I agree they're not in interrelated. But the point will be, I wanted to say to Honourable Member from the onset, can you hold on on the issues of partnerships and so forth? That's why I said, let's focus on the audit outcomes. Now then we give self. The only thing I, I thought to me, the point was, from AG's point of view, do they, and I, unfortunately AG, I didn't hear you giving that answer, but we are fine, we can deal with There was, does AG not see the need that matters of procurement of this nature should be under the ambit of the National Treasury, specifically on issues of the procurement officer? But I guess you wanted to run away from that terrain because in my view, they may not, you may not have competency over that one. Now, I will allow Honourable Minister relax then when it comes to the presentation, that answer, it is correct. Only when then we, we get that presentation. So can you allow Honourable Members that we go to the self-presentation? Uh, you will have a second bite, including uh, responding to what has been given. Please, can you? Yes. Chair, I, I absolutely, I'm fine with that. I'm absolutely fine with that because you've actually clarified exactly what I was asking, 
which was about the vetting process that is done at PetroSA. However, Chair, I have to raise this because the Minister is out of line. This committee is the oversight committee of Parliament to which he accounts, to which CEF accounts, to which the Department accounts. And I will not be prevented by the Minister from asking any question I like in this committee. So the Minister can rant and rave all he likes, but I will ask those questions. I will ask the questions that make him uncomfortable because that's my job. And he must recognize that he's not a law unto himself, that he reports to Parliament. Honourable and Parliament is over, oversight of that Honourable chair. Him. Please, please. No one said we don't have a right. That's why I rebutted, I said, this committee has not made an opinion. Honorable member, you know what we're going to do? And I always say this thing, let's focus on the task at hand. We will end up by the time we are supposed to finish this meeting, we will not have done justice on the actual content and the presentation. Can we focus? I, I don't want to. I can tell you now, maybe I should have said this, probably this, the Secretary have said, we don't have any other time. If we don't finish today, good luck, they will meet the next committee in the next uh, term. Because we're told on the date we have requested, there will be no committees allowed. So I, I urge and beg us, can we focus on this matter? Uh, Honorable Minister, can you lead the self-presentation overview? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, the Chairperson and the CEO of the SEF Group to start the presentation. I can see that. Because you have been influencing one another, just influence each other very easily by exchanges yes. the chairs. Okay. So what we're going to do is uh, to hand over them to make the presentation. Uh, except that a person, I know my role, I know the relationship with the portfolio committee. I'm not a subject of the portfolio committee, it does oversight on me. I'm a different arm of government. I'm not a subject of the portfolio committee. I report and they do oversight. But Mr. Malam is misinterpreting his oversight role on me. I am in a different arm of government. I come here and account all the time. I never resisted that. Can we uh, please? Please yeah. continue. Uh, Honourable Chair and Honourable Members of the Committee, good morning, uh, greetings. Uh, greetings again to my Principal, the Minister, the DG and the officials uh, from the DMRE and also the colleagues that I have brought along uh, to the Committee. Um, just to focus us, um, Chair, as I understood you, you asked that we just focus on the audit outcomes. Uh, just for no, 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 not you. No, no, no. It was the last session. We have dealt with this now. Deal with the presentation. If I want to summarize it, the current state of SAF. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> so let me. Uh, okay, thank you. I. Okay. Um, so let me do this properly. Um, again, if I, I can then uh, follow proper protocol and greet you again, Che, and the honorable members. Uh, also, come back to my principal, the minister, the DG, the officials also from the DMRE that I acknowledge, uh, the DDG's senior officials, chairs of the subsidiaries that are here today, uh, which I will also just introduce quickly for the committee. Uh, the SEF group CEO who's uh, next to me, uh, and also the CEOs and the executives from the subsidiaries and the other colleagues that are accompanying us today. Uh, good morning again and all protocol observed. 
Um, again, my name is Ayanda Noah. I'm the chairman of the SAFE group, and we are here to focus more on the financial year 2023 uh, that ended on March 31st, and really just to look at how we have performed and the final uh, audit outcomes, and also looking at the uh, long-term commercial sustainability of the business, uh, looking at the strategic relevance in line with what we were asked to uh, talk to as we were preparing to come here to do the presentation. So I've got a, you know, just a few aspects that I want to cover, but I think it's very important, again, that I just start off with acknowledging the chairs of the um, two committees, the, the, the uh, subsidiaries, uh, SFF, um, Ms. Makubane, uh, who was part of us, and also the passing of Ms. Sonjo, which was also referred to earlier on this morning. I think it's really very important that we just remember them in our hearts because they were very, very uh, strong and supported us in the making sure that we achieve the targets and we discharge our overall uh, oversight um, uh, duties as the boards. Uh, and also in the process, they were flying high the gender uh, flag and therefore it is really a big loss to us. And as I have been reflecting with the team, I have said that, you know, death really, as you reflect on it, it doesn't feel like it happened then, but it really feels like right now and today. Uh, so it is really with that that I would like to again say that their souls may they rest in peace. Um, Chair, let me just um, ask the uh, colleagues as I introduce them. Uh, Chair Kize, I saw him here somewhere. Uh, he is now chairing uh, SFF. Uh, I've also got Chair Swanepu um, here with us uh, from AE. We've got also Chair Rupa, I saw him somewhere, uh, also from uh, PASA. Um, we also have the group CEO next to me, as I've already said. We've got the acting PASA CEO, Dr. Mukoka, uh, next to his chair. We've also got uh, the acting CEO of Petro SA, Ms. Makadla, who is sitting uh, behind me. Uh, and also, of course, the incoming um, permanent CEO, Mr. Sizani, uh, whom I'll talk about later, Mr. Mwahi next to his chair, and also Mr. Pizwe next to his chair. Um, CFO, Ms. Murabe, uh, next to me, who's going to be doing... Uh... <laughs> in, in fact, I should also introduce him as the interim CEO of the SNPC, which I'll talk to in a moment as well. Um, we also have the Mr. Mtetwa, the new CFO from uh, AE, uh, is here. Uh, Ms. Ali, Ms. Uh, Mr. Mashambi also uh, is here. While I'm dealing with the chairs of the uh, committees, I think it is also in order that I indicate that Mr. Boyer, who was the chair of Petro SA, resigned. Uh, he resigned both as the Petro SA chair and also as the non-executive director of um, CEF. And uh, in that regard, we really have a number of initiatives that we have put in place, in particular considering the merger, to make sure that uh, you know, that area is taken care of. As I will also mention a bit later on, um, with the merger, there has been an approval of the um, legacy board, which will then oversee the subsidiaries that are going to be uh, merging. Again, honorable members, I think when we do have the engagement, we talk about how complex the environment that we operate in is. And really, it's for us shifting from a world of VUCA and we are now moving to the world of Bani, which is really a, a very difficult one to uh, navigate, and it's quite a, a challenge. VUCA being volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous, and Bani being brittle, anxious, non-linear, and incomprehensible. So it's really quite a challenging environment, and it requires that we look at our rules, we look at our values, and we acknowledge that they no longer apply to the current situation, and we then have to find a way to uh, just navigate the environment. 
Uh, if you look at what is happening globally, it affects us, uh, the geopolitical uh, shifts that are across the globe. If you look at the climate change issues, we have to respond to those. Uh, the supply chain disruptions impact on what we do. Uh, the role of multinationals and traders also in the energy space, it affects what we do. Um, and also the fact that upstream is really a litigious environment, it also impacts on what we do and how we deliver on our mandate to ensure security of energy supply. There's also you know, economic fragmentation and also just artificial intelligence or AI, as we call it these days, which really touches on everything that we do. So things are really not the same and therefore we also need to be alive to that and make sure that as we navigate and try to deliver on our um, uh, mandate, those are the things that we do consider. I think that at the outset, I really would like to appreciate the committee, the PCMRE, uh, through your leadership chair, for really having given us the support, uh, for guiding us, uh, for shambocking us when you needed to, and for just really just waking us up and, um, you know, helping us to, you know, to guide ourselves through this very difficult uh, environment. We really must say that we've enjoyed the collaboration with the committee and also taken in uh, you know, the input and the feedback that we have received from the committee, uh, which we try to infuse into what we do. We also, of course, thank our honorable minister, who has also been our conscience, who really has been very firm, and also ensured that he gives us the direction. And also, when we get stuck, we you know, get shaken up a bit, and we also get guided um, Patiswa, in looking at uh, solutions uh, and different opportunities. And, and really we appreciate also, uh, Honorable Minister, the fact that you have championed key conversations, uh, really that some people are very uncomfortable to talk about. Uh, and it really has made our lives a lot easier. It's given us a lot more work, uh, which is really what we are here for and what the executives are being paid to do. And it is really something that we appreciate. And as we make our presentation today, we really would like the committee to note that when it comes to improving the gender profile in the company, we really have made some strides. We've looked at ensuring that we stabilize the ailing entities, uh, the likes of uh, Petro SA. Um, and of course now with what we have heard around AE, we have to really up our game in terms of entrenching our parenting strategy and making sure that we support uh, AE better to have better audit outcomes. Um, we also have up, um, developed and affirmed a group inter integrated um, strategic roadmap which really defines where we are going to be in the next little while and also f looking at how we can really become a high performance organization and how we can do that through strengthened strategic partnerships, having a number of um, projects in the pipeline, and also really just organizing ourselves and uh, putting ourselves together in order we, that we can succeed um, and become strategically relevant. I also think that really the, it's, it's important that I talk to a number of key pertinent matters that the SEF board has been seized with and starting with the Petro SA stabilization and turnaround, I think really one of the areas that we are really significantly proud of uh, from a Petro SA point of view is that for the first time in seven years, they have recorded a profit of over a billion rand. This is really important and significant for the Petro SA team because it boosted their confidence. It showed them that it can be done. They can actually get out of um, this very difficult uh, situation. And part of getting out of this situation is making sure that the reinstatement of the um, GTL refinery becomes priority and, and is accelerated. So there is a lot of hard work that is being done uh, towards that, which the team will talk about as they go through their presentation. Um, it is also important to note that the other leg of ensuring that we turn around uh, Petro SA is really through 
trading, sales, and marketing business, uh, and making sure that we bolster the outputs uh, from that side in order to achieve the targets uh, and the turnaround strategy. So in terms of the AG matters, I think there is a very comprehensive presentation that is going to be talked to, but maybe just one or two points that I would like to talk to and you know, really just give commitments that we have had engagements with the AG um, you know, around the matter that was of serious concern to ourselves, which is the qualification at group level. And we converged to signing off um, on the um, outcome uh, that was delivered. And we also realized that we need to hold hands better, to collaborate better, and also internally, we've looked at ways of really just strengthening the, the relationship between ourselves and the, uh, and the auditor general, and also make sure that internally we strengthen our own parenting strategy in terms of making sure that the oversight on the subsidiaries is strengthened. We do have the group growth agenda, uh, which really is targeting key investments uh, you know, across the country and with various partnerships, and really to make sure that we diversify our portfolio. We want to make sure that the revenue streams of SEF Group are really focused on acquiring assets in the energy market so that we can really deliver on our ambitious uh, mandate of security of supply. Now, just talking uh, to the governance issues, you know, a number of changes did happen uh, between 2023 financial year and 2024. And some of those changes were really necessitated by operational requirements. We needed to have some compliance. And of course, as I've mentioned, sadly, we had death as well uh, at board levels. And therefore, we've had to bolster key governance and operational oversight matters so that day-to-day -day operational requirements of the business do take place and they are not stifled. And so that we are also able to deliver on the merger, uh, which is the SNPC. Uh, to that extent, I would like to again just reconfirm that Mr. Sizani has been appointed as the CEO, the permanent CEO of uh, Petro SA. I think he did raise his hand when I mentioned his name. And Mr. Mteto, I've already spoken to him. And uh, Dr. Mugoka is currently acting um, as the PASA CEO due to the resignation of Dr. Masangani. So those are some of the changes that have taken place. Of course, we are you know, living in South Africa, so we do see what um, is in the public domain in terms of, you know, different online platforms and also uh, the likes of Carte Blanche. One example I think has already been uh, spoken to in terms of, you know, the matters that do surface which we have to uh, look at. And we also make sure that from a board perspective, we look at those matters. In terms of the merger, uh, a lot of work has been done there, and we've really made a lot of progress since the last time that we were here. Uh, the first of the very key and critical um, advancements is the fact that the SNPC board and the legacy board were announced uh, just a f about a week ago. We now have those boards in place. We also have appointed uh, on a um, secondment basis, the SNPC CEO, Mr. Mwahi, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but I do want to assure uh, the committee that we have structured ourselves in such a way that we do have a seamless transition from the uh, current boards that are going to be dissolving to uh, the legacy board and also the SNPC board. I think let me perhaps at this point, uh, honorable chair and honorable members, uh, hand over to the um, CEO so that he can take us through with the team uh, the presentation that we have. We have really tried to ensure that it talks to the three matters that have been asked of us to address. And I believe that we have adequately addressed those matters and we then shall do so as I hand over to uh, Dr. Bullo. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you uh, Chairperson. Uh, Honourable Minister, Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee, Honourable Members of the Portfolio Committee. Uh, the structure, of course, of our presentation, Chair, is that we are a number of 
subsidiaries as the CEOs will then come in on their respective uh, entities as we submit at the group level. Chairperson, the audit outcomes for the year 2022-2023, we would like us to draw our attention on the left-hand side of the presentation as the issues of AE have been really uh, talked to quite uh, elaborate and AE will still come. But what I want to highlight is the fact that you could see across the group a consistent performance in terms of the, uh, uh, the outcomes where we received unqualified audit findings with findings, except of course for AE, like we said, uh, which then affected the group. But there have been consistent performance in as far as the outcomes are concerned. Next slide. Now, as a self group, we've closed a total of eight audit findings cumulatively over the past two financial years, reducing the number of material findings from five to three between 2021, 2022, and 2022-2023 financial years. The SEF group will continue to foster good relations with the AG team to ensure that the benefits of value additions are realized uh, in the process, as the positive audit outcomes for us are critical in the uh, capital uh, fundraising. Chair, on this uh, particular slide, all we are trying to highlight is basically significant work that has been realized uh, over a period and the significant progress we've made uh, with the audit findings at the group level. You'd notice on the first three that I want to talk to is that the issue there on the first one was the issue of the material adjustments or misstatements on the financial statement. So accordingly, with assistance, of course, and guidance of the AG, we will then start to prepare quarterly interim financial statement so that we strengthen the quality assurance thereof. We believe this approach will uh, see us improving quite significantly, uh, both at the group and subsidiary level. And secondly, Chair, the issue on the AE771 uh, million regular expenditure, like I said, it has been talk to, but AE will still come in, but mainly there, it was because of that gap where we had no CFO at AE at the time, and therefore the issue of training and the fact that the CFO is now appointed, we believe that we will see major and significant uh, progress in that regard. Uh, the third one being the disclaimer, basically on the KPI on the performance side, on the CEFSOC level, is that the lesson learned there is that we need to comply with the uh, guidance of uh, uh, the Treasury uh, guidelines in as far as this is concerned and ensure that every time we get uh, the feedback, uh, basically in writing from the uh, uh, shareholder and not basically uh, continue on the tested one. Uh, continue on the issue of the group overview. This uh, slide is very familiar to the members, but allow me to mandate mainly on two areas of fostering sustainable development of the energy sector through research and strategic acquisition, and also the driving of economic enhancement by ensuring energy security to enhance industry and other economic activities. Chair, if we are to summarize our group performance, we're pleased to report that we've made 1.7 billion net profit. This financial year that's been reported, which is higher than the previous year uh, by 1.6 billion. And Chairperson, our net assets have also improved as a result of acquisition of uh, Avedia, Romco, BP, Terminal, and Aqua, um, Aqua Restoring Investments as well. Uh, uh, then yielding the total uh, assets of our portfolio at about 34.4 billion rand. Chairperson, you also note that we really don't have debts, and therefore, in that sense, we still have got quite a play in leveraging our balance sheet to advance our mandate. Chair, also, if you note that on other KPIs as well, 
we have managed to basically train uh, 182 of the GITs, uh, and we've used overall 15.6 million on skills development, as it were. There have been significant progress as well on the issue of the solar giza installation, where when we started, it was uh, below, if I'm not mistaken, 1,000, and now we are sitting at uh, 22,000 for this report. And I must say that we'll be reporting a significant move, as it were, where the actual performance as we stand to date is over 35,000 installed cases. Chairperson, we also note on this one, the group cash balance that's sitting at 13.1 billion uh, with an improved uh, uh, delivery on the coal side of uh, AE to ESCOM, which also shows the importance of uh, SOE, SOE collaboration, which has really assisted both entities in moving uh, forward, Chairperson. Chairperson, with regards to the aqua restaurant, which is important, uh, given the load shading challenges, is that the commencement of operations days for aqua redstone is anticipated to be in quarter two of 2023-2024 financial year. Chairperson, with regard to our self-group scorecard, uh, we must say that, Chair, on the first output on the strategic theme of consolidation and turnaround, we have uh, seen basically a strong achievement with the SNPC inception now. Uh, hence, on that one, we are partially achieved. And the initiative at AE, especially on the liquidity side, a chairperson is encouraging. And uh, the incremental improvement at Petros A chairperson, and we believe now that the decision has been made that we move to the next phase of the measure, we will see a lot of uh, achievement in that uh, scorecard. Commercial sustainability, Chairperson, we have uh, really uh, achieved quite strongly on that project as a result of the acquisition that I've made, where we strengthened our balance sheet, as it were, with the new acquisitions that I've mentioned uh, previously. In terms of the long-term strategy and growth, we have really shown a strong achievement in project conversion and portfolio growth, with a strong improvement in the management of the brand as well, based on the independent assessment on the brand strength. And also in the human performance and organizational alignment, Chairperson, we have partially achieved that one, mainly due to the delays on the shared services implementation, uh, but various uh, major initiatives are soon going to follow, and there will be a significant improvement on the scorecard. And lastly, on operational excellence, Chairperson, we are reporting that various projects are held in, were held in abeyance due to the measure, but now that the measure is, is approved, we'll be able to move first. Now the question would be, was there no need to do some other work? Other issues were really as a result of structural nature of the program itself. As an example, your IT systems, uh, whose architects should be embedded in this new entity, of course, was bound to be, for an example, delayed. But now that we've got an approval, we will see significant progress. Chairperson, the SEF group has seen incremental progress over time. And again, putting emphasis on the commercial sustainability, which is of paramount, Chairperson. Like I say, I repeat that we have seen the improvement as a result of our additional investment on the ROMCO where we've increased our uh, investment and shareholding from 25 to 40%, 40%. a very significant uh, uh, decision we made here and quite an achievement because when you look even of the ultra years uh, in terms of performance, we already are seeing and, be and benefiting from uh, the proceeds of that entity, almost matching what we've been historically. So that was a good decision, uh, Chairperson, and hence, our strengthened balance sheet. The other issue, Chairperson, is the 25% of the aqua redstone, and that we will begin as soon as the commencement day of operations begin. Also, we'll see in a short space of time us beginning to draw some profits from that, uh, uh, dividends from that project. 
Chairperson, the issue of also acquisition of Avidia, amongst others, and the BB terminals. All of this have strengthened us further, Chair. So although the challenges exist uh, as a group, but progress has really been made in terms of uh, delivering on our mandate and our long-term strategy. Chairperson, before I hand over to my colleague, I want to uh, step a bit on this one and uh, really report and confirm with the progress we've made in terms of uh, movement and uh, uh, improvements, as indeed uh, ver uh, verified by the AG. Another body, the Department of Monitoring and Evaluation, uh, when we started here, Chairperson, you would recall that the, we were in the category, on the red category as the SAF group. If you look at that, I think we are line six. We were on the red category uh, amongst uh, other Schedule two entities. And at that point, we were requiring agent intervention, but a significant improvement has been made and we have moved from that account to the evaluation to the entity that requires minor intervention. Over to you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, uh, Honorable Minister, DG, Chairs of the um, Subsidiaries and the CEOs. So on the slide that is flighted, we're trying to show the improvement in the group in terms of profit and losses, in terms of cash flow balances, and also the net, net asset value that we have recorded. Important to note is that um, the group closed uh, with a high net profit, which is the highest since 2013-2014 of 1.7 billion. And that is as a result of the impairment reversals and also the calculated calculation of address a rehabilitation provision and also the approval of um, um, uh, SFF to retain the proceeds of the sale of the strategic stock. Also important to note is that the good performance in terms of finance, uh, in terms of the net profits, has a spillover on the net asset value, which also increased. Also important to note is that share the cash has reduced for the period under review, mainly because there were investments that were made uh, during the period under review, one investment on Romkov and also Avedia in support of the um, investment drive within the group. On the next slide, we are showing now in terms of financial performance, the contribution of each subsidiary. Important to note is that Four out of the six active subsidiaries uh, recorded a net profit, and the lead there is coming from Petrus A, as uh, it has been explained earlier. And this is as a result of high volumes that were sold within Petrus A, and also the rehabilitation uh, provision that was reduced by 2.7 billion within Petrus A. Uh, I need to mention as well, Chairperson, that in the prior year, we had impaired the loans that were given to Petro SA. And due to the improved uh, financial performance, those loans within the parent company have since been uh, reversed. And then that is why you see now the SEFSOC reporting as well, among others, the highest uh, net profit for the financial year. On the next slide, Chair. We are now doing a comparison between the financial performance of the pr prior financial year and uh, the financial year under review. As I've indicated, the net profit is 1.7 billion uh, in the year under review compared to the 63 million that was reported in the pr prior year. And this is mainly due to the, those adjustments that were made on the decommissioning provision within Petro SA and also the improved revenue performance uh, coming from the unit that deals with finished product trading and also the re reversals of the impairments. 
And uh, another important uh, effect to emphasize is that the cost containment measures that have been implemented <coughs> through the tripartite war room also yielded positive results in Federal SA. On the this slide, we're now showing the comparison of uh, the year ending 2022 and 2023 in relation to the uh, financial position. Our assets have increased by 17% as compared to the prior year, increasing from 29.3 billion to 35.4 billion. And this is uh, mainly due to the additional investment of two billion into the ROM process, and also aqua additional investment of 17 million, <coughs> and the aqua loan advanced of 210 million, CMG loan advanced of 2 billion, and also acquisition of 60% of Avidia, and acquisition of 50% of BP terminal. On the next slide, Chairperson, same comparison, prior year and the year under review for the cash flow position. As indicated, there's an in decrease of 7% in the cash at hand at the end of the financial year. And this is mainly due to the cash, negative cash generated from operations. Just to expand on this, Chairperson, the previous financial year, we uh, there was a positive uh, cash uh, generated from op uh, operations of 1.5 billion. And in the current financial year, the cash that was utilized from operations is 1.3 billion. This is a combination of negatives coming from uh, cash utilized of 2.2 billion. And also the finance cost that we have paid of 405 million the tax that was paid that is higher uh, as compared to the previous financial year as well of 393 million. But that position was countered by interest income that was higher than the previous financial year of 932 million. And also the dividends received from associates of 791 million. And as I've indicated, Chairperson, we have, um, um, made efforts in terms of uh, investing in projects to support our investment drive. Uh, the four items that we have, or projects that we have invested in, it's Romco 2 billion, and then Aqua 70 million, Avedia 85 million, and the 300 million for the BPSA terminal. So on the uh, financial governance, Chairperson, um, the total of irregular expenditure that we have closed with in the prior year was 1.1 billion. And then for the year under review, this amount uh, increased, the closing balance increased to 4.2 billion. And if you look at the contributing subsidiaries to the movements of 2022-23, the highest comes from SFF, and this is as a re as in relation to the uh, out-of-pocket expenses uh, due to the reversal of the uh, sale of strategic stock. And then followed by uh, AEMFC with 700 and 771 million, and this is as a result of transgression in terms of uh, <coughs> following a PFMA transcript. SEF recorded a smaller amount of 202 million, and then Petro SA is 40, I mean 202 yes, million, and then 202,000, sorry, Chair, and then Petro SA recorded 48. <laughs> <laughs> so it's 202,000 for SEF SOC, and then 48.2 million for Petro SA. And then uh, on fruitless and wasteful expenditure, there are a couple of uh, entities that contributed to that, particularly on the movements for the year under review. AE contributed the highest of 4.9 million. And then SEFSOC 
844,000. Uh, Passa, 1 million. I guess, 13,000. Federal SA, 12,000. So the total that was recorded for the year under review is 6.8 million. And then um, taking the, 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 the total for the whole um, historical uh, transgressions as well as the year under review to 27.1 million. So what I need to mention, Chair, is that the loss control committees that are established across the group are really assisting in terms of making progress in terms of identifying cases <coughs> and also recommending um, the sanctions that should be taken against the transgressors. And some of the disciplinary processes are underway and few of those were also concluded in the year under review. And the board is also working with us to ensure that we strengthen controls within the, the group as a whole. That's all from me, Chair. Thank you. Good morning to you, Chair, um, honorable members, honorable minister, uh, chair of the group, subsidiary chairs and CEOs. Uh, just like to highlight the EGAS performance for the financial year under review. And the first is that we uh, received a dividend of uh, just over 790 million rands, and that was uh, exceeding the, KP the KPI by over 71%. In terms of the Ramco share purchase transaction, that was concluded ahead of time, um, being concluded in the first quarter of the uh, financial year versus the fourth quarter. And then, uh, in addition, I would also like to report that Petro SA has, in the current financial year, received its gas trading license from NERSA, which has enabled uh, the ENH and Petro SA joint venture. We are reporting this year as EGAS because the project started under EGAS and has since been transferred to Petro SA but uh, EGAS is still very much involved in the uh, uh, development and execution of the project. Uh, in terms of the low lights, uh, the negotiated uh, agreements for that uh, was not signed, for that was not signed, for the establishment of the joint venture was not signed in that uh, current year, but since then we can report that we have signed the gas uh, uh, sales agreement and the current uh, agreements that are outstanding are the um, a memorandum of incorporation and the shareholders agreement for the establishment of that joint venture. But we do believe that with the granting of the nursal license, this will give us the impetus to move forward. Thank you, next slide. So looking at our financial performance and based on that uh, uh, dividend that we received, our net profit for the period ended 31st of March, 2023, was uh, 771.4 million, and that was compared to the prior year of just over uh, 408 million. Uh, this is mainly due to the increase in the equity acquisition of Ramco, as well as the counting of the Ramco investments. Thank you very much, next slide, thank you. So in terms of uh, uh, our uh, analysis of our findings, there's definitely been a significant improvement in the uh, closing uh, uh, of material findings. So a total of five material findings were closed in the past two financial years and only one new financial uh, recorded uh, for the, the year under review. So going into the details of that, uh, that key finding, there was a material misstatement uh, on the an annual financial uh, statements whereby the Fs were not prepared in accordance with uh, the prescribed uh, financial reporting uh, frameworks as required by the PFMA. And the material uh, misstatements on the statements of cash flows where the loan advanced uh, was classified incorrectly under financing activities instead of being classified as uh, an investment activity. So in terms of our intervention, we will be preparing quarterly interim uh, financial statements and this will uh, uh, and we'll also look to strengthen our, our internal quality assurance. Then looking at our strategic direction and outlook going forward, uh, the first on commercial sustainability, and here the target is a profitability uh, via a dividend of uh, 792 million for the current financial year. Uh, we can report that as of December 2023, 
uh, we received a, 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 a dividend of 460 million rands and a second dividend for March uh, 2024 has been declared. So that brings, uh, that means we've exceeded our target once again with a total dividend for the year of 920 million rands. In terms of the Romco direction, proportionate with our increase in shareholding, we're looking to increase the number of directors on the Romco board and then uh, the Romco's project transformer uh, to implement the uh, uh, a plan to exit the operations and maintenance agreement. That operations and maintenance agreement is agreement between Romco and uh, Sasol, whereby Sasol operates and maintains uh, the Romco pipeline, but we're looking for Romco to actually become fully independent of uh, um, uh, Sasol. In terms of uh, strategic growth, uh, looking at gas uh, infrastructure and presenting opportunities to the EES board for approvals, and then technical assistance provided to CEF. Then on the SANPC enablement and corporate excellence, uh, we will be supporting the uh, merger and transition project schedule, the target being to conclude the lease and assignment agreement. We can uh, report at this point that we have uh, concluded that lease assignment agreement with uh, conditions precedent related to our uh, loans with Standard Bank for the uh, purchase of the Romco, additional Romco shares. Then in terms of organizational capacitation and human capital performance, the uh, target being to uh, uh, develop a resource plan and implement that in collaboration with the merger teams, and that has been done. Uh, in terms of our corporate governance and ERM, target being to uh, develop a CEF-based risk maturity plan and to achieve ERM maturity level two uh, for the year, and we can report that uh, the plan has been is in place and we've actually exceeded the target and achieved level three. Then in terms of stakeholder management and socioeconomic transformation, uh, to have a uh, uh, stakeholder management plan approved and managed with quarterly reporting, and that is in place. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, um, uh, Chair, and, and, and good, um, good afternoon to, uh, good morning still to you and the, and the, and the, and the members. Chair, I think the, the first point on, um, from a standpoint of highlight that we start off with as PASA is the one that uh, brought uh, stability at the level of the leadership of the organization where we saw the appointment of uh, new directors, including the, the chairperson. And I think uh, that was uh, encouraging also in the during the reporting period because that leadership stability at that level uh, remains uh, critical. And I think uh, the second point, Chair, from the standpoint of the highlights relates to the approved funding that we received as part of for phase two of the Shell Gas program. And I think for us, Chair, this project um, uh, holds important fortunes uh, from an economic um, benefit standpoint for, uh, for the country. And, and we view it as a critical project uh, in the upstream uh, space uh, uh, onshore. And, and I think the third point, Chair, on from a um, highlight standpoint is the, uh, the work that has been going on from an upstream uh, development resources bill perspective and the work that went on during the reporting period led, um, Chair, to um, the bill being passed by uh, this very same committee uh, with uh, PASA providing uh, technical support and, uh, and services to the, to the DMRE and uh, progress is still being made in this regard, um, uh, Chair, where the bill passed the uh, National Assembly, but it's also currently now under the NCOP for um, consideration. And I think uh, that's one of the highlights that uh, uh, investors in the space are looking at uh, quite eagerly to bring more certainty from the standpoint of regulation, but also uh, from the standpoint of uh, indicating and giving direction and leadership from a regulation standpoint uh, in the upstream sector. And I think, Chair, uh, importantly also was the heads of term signature in relation to, um, uh, to seismic that uh, will be at the core of uh, the reprocessing of the data that we um, have uh, from the standpoint of uh, PASA and from a low light standpoint, Chair, I think, um, the first point indicates the high stakes nature of the upstream sector 
where there was a drilling of a well and unfortunately we, um, the industry came up uh, empty in that regard, but it also shows commitment uh, from an investment standpoint and I think what was also positive was that uh, the reception was uh, good from a stakeholder standpoint. Uh, some delays were experienced, Chair, in moving into uh, our office during the, the reporting period simply because of delays in availing backup generators uh, um, from the standpoint of the um, landlord. Chair, the third point I think is, is one that uh, is quite um, uh, significant in relation to the capacitation of the of the agency, and I think uh, we've moved in relation to uh, jumping the hoops together with the uh, consulting industry on the new fee structure. It going through our board, the DMRE, and now it's currently with the National Treasury for consideration, and hopefully um, this um, uh, will be closed uh, soon. And next slide, Chair, gives an overview of the income statement that is linked to the point that uh, just made. Um, what you are seeing there, Chair, is that under the reporting period, uh, even though a loss was reported, uh, the efforts of management and the board actually halved the budgeted loss um, uh, during that uh, reporting period. And I think two interventions to change that picture, given the allocations that are uh, presented on the right column. Uh, one is um, uh, closure of that uh, fees application, but secondly is to increase uh, self-revenue generation through uh, data sales. At the core of that being the reprocessing of the wealth of data that sits uh, with PASA, that PASA is a custodian of, and I think it is important to indicate that the upside of uh, increasing uh, data sales uh, is linked also to um, the prospectivity uh, of our uh, um, upstream onshore and offshore um, improving over time and uh, uh, 11B, 12B is such a case where the initial work of PASA led to that uh, uh, the big discovery. Next slide please. Uh, Chair, what the slides indicate, uh, as the slide indicates, um, is that uh, if we had not had uh, the one finding that um, we had on cutoff uh, in relation to creditors, we would have, as PASA, have gotten a clean audit. Um, um, uh, since our one long-standing finding um, had been closed during this, uh, uh, this period. Next slide, please. This chair slide just uh, indicates some of the issues that we engaged uh, the AG on that were closed. Next slide, please. Chair, I think uh, maybe let me spend a bit of time on this, um, on this slide in relation to the strategic direction and, and outlook. On this first point, uh, Chair, it is our view that uh, increased activity upstream in terms of the drilling of wells uh, is important for, for our development in this uh, country. And we are looking at uh, the target of drilling 14 exploration uh, wells uh, uh, and uh, uh, development wells by 2025 with uh, um, five being um, offshore and 20 wells being uh, onshore. And, and that split is mainly determined by also the cost and appetite that we are seeing from uh, the market in relation to uh, upstream interest that has increased within the South African shores. So that, that, that increased exploration and production for us uh, remains a, a key strategic um, um, uh, area of focus and in our view, it holds the next economic fortunes for uh, the South African economy, uh, both onshore and um, uh, offshore. And the second uh, strategic pillar, Chair, relates to uh, stakeholder engagement and advocacy. And, and uh, Chair, here, the, the bill demonstrates also the extent to which it becomes critical uh, from uh, a stakeholder engagement and advocacy standpoint uh, to, to, to have a dedicated focus to engage communities, uh, the people who are affected by um, the, the oil and gas uh, developments. And I think 
we are finding um, a lot of reception as opposed to uh, what is being projected by uh, some organization in, uh, in organizations around uh, this area. So I think a laser focus in relation to uh, dispelling some of the myths around upstream uh, development becomes uh, important and remains important for us um, as PASA. And the third um, strategic area of focus, which is really at the core of our function, relates to operational excellence in relation to, to technical evaluation of the applications that come in the form of uh, uh, permits, licenses, and so forth. And that uh, also technical evaluation from the standpoint of uh, environmental um, impact assessment reports that form this critical part of the uh, consideration of whether to grant or not grant on continued uh, um, uh, monitoring and evaluation in relation to, to the sector. So that for PASA remains a critical area of, uh, uh, of focus. And Chair, the, the, the fourth uh, strategic area of focus remains financial sustainability. And, and I think what we've realized over time um, was that there was this, this um, sporadic purchases of data from industry, but also um, uh, industry saying to, to us, if you repackage and reprocess more of your data, uh, you'll have more regularized uh, uh, revenue generation. And, and that's one thing, Chair, that uh, we are focusing on in relation to the financial sustainability of uh, uh, PASA as a regulator. And, and, and at the core of that, uh, Chair, relates to um, uh, revenue generation independence from um, uh, allocations because we have a wealth of technical capability from the standpoint of data analysis and processing that the industry and other regulators uh, have found uh, to, be, uh, to be of value simply because this country over time has uh, invested greatly in building this capacity and this skill. So I think. In our view, Chair, it's time to reap the rewards as a country. And lastly, Chair, our strategic focus remains digital transformation because the sale and the presentation of this data um, is going to be uh, based on um, uh, the digital uh, platforms with us taking it from the physical and interfacing it with the, uh, with the dig digital. So those are the, the key five strategic um, areas of um, uh, direction, Chair, that we think uh, are critical for PASA going forward to, pre to improve from the uh, performance that we are presenting to the committee today. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm going to now hand over to uh, Ms. Magadha from PetroSA. Thank you, Chair. Uh, through you, Chair, all protocols observed. I will try and summarize. I will not read each and every line item. I think the key uh, takeaways from this slide is the fact that as the group CFO has highlighted in terms of the performance uh, that PetroSA has made the net profit and one of the main major contributing factors uh, being the increase in sales as well as the adjustment in uh, rehabilitation decommissioning liability, um, which was done through an independent uh, party to make sure that what we have is not gold-plated, is fit for purpose. It is a continuous process because in the oil industry, even what we're seeing in the Gulf and other areas of the world, there is improvement in technology to try and find solutions that reduce that liability. Secondly, uh, in terms of the low lights, though we have improved, we know that there is a discrepancy in terms of what we have in the kitty and what we expect it to have. So that remains a major challenge which uh, puts PetroSA uh, to, uh, to have its liabilities higher than its, uh, its assets. And then secondly, we have clear matching orders from the shareholder uh, as well as the ministry to make sure that we, uh, we come up with sustainable commercial solutions uh, that will enable us to continue to deliver both on our commercial mandate as well as our developmental mandate, which is, uh, is clear that the operations in Mosul Bay 
must continue to operate, but we must make sure that we're operating, we have commercial sustainable uh, solutions for Mosselberg. I will talk to that in terms of our journey, uh, which underpins our turnaround strategies, which is some of the partnerships that have been highlighted. The next slide. The numbers, this slide just talks to, again, it just outlays the numbers, so I will not detail it. Uh, go to the next slide, sir. From a, an audit point of view, it has been highlighted uh, that we, we have managed uh, to reduce our findings. If you look at the trajectory uh, from 2021 to 2022, we've, we've seen a, a, an improvement uh, in terms of us uh, reducing the number of material findings and also closing findings, which means we've reduced our open findings from, well, from eight to four. This is an area where we, uh, we also still remain challenged, uh, but we are focusing, I think the key thing here is to understand that directionally we are going towards the right direction because as we navigate the challenges that we're faced with, we also need to balance it with the governance that is expected from us. Next slide. Um, these are the findings, it just summarizes the findings. I am not going to dwell on the, on the items, but I will jump on to the, to the projects that are underpinning our turnaround strategy. Sorry, no. the there is a member, Honorable Mashaule, you want to raise a point of order, procedure, privilege. I don't know what it is, Chair, but uh, uh, Ms. Magasa just moved too fast for my slowness in uh, slide 36. Okay. On the right-hand side, uh, you, you, you didn't explain what is happening. When you say a material as uncertainty exists, regarding the entity's ability to honor obligations as they fall due because of low cash reserves. I, I think, touch on that, what does it mean? As I indicated in the first slide. Okay, wait, 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 wait. And it's not a question, Chair, it's just that she, she, she <coughs> when she arrived there, she said uh, the financials, I won't talk about them, and then moved. Okay, let's do it like this, ne? Um, there is no word I don't like, it says briefing notes. Let's just say, try in some of the areas to give substance on the intention of the item related to. Okay, you can, you can reinforce what you were saying on that specific part. I'm hoping I've, I've, answer, I've heard correctly. Now I'll allow the CFO through you, Chair, if the CFO can assist, and then I can continue. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, with regards to our financial performance, um, the revenue from Petro SA in the current financial, the financial year that we're reporting on um, increased almost by 100%. Um, um, the Overall performance was improved because of the reduction in the provision for decommission that was um, processed through the intervention as it has already been mentioned by the CEO. With regards to the question that has been posed um, on the commentary that we have uh, with regards to our ability to honor our obligations, we have the facility that um, was put on hold since uh, December 2020, to which the CO will go through the interventions that have been put in place. Um, we are managing and um, fin funding that operation, um, which does not necessarily generate in cash for Petro SA, uh, which does have an impact on the funds um, that are available for us. Um, which requires uh, the interventions that we have embarked on. So that is the challenge that we are facing, which we believe um, it is uh, prudent for us to be open and transparent about um, in terms of our cash position and the financial 
um, health of Petro SA. Um, also, I must mention, as it is included there, the support that we're getting, which was also included or mentioned by the group CFO, the tripartite war room that is looking at our cost containment initiatives um, to make sure that the costs that we're incurring are those that are critical, safety related, and also the maintenance of the facility that we are uh, managing. Okay, continue. You see now, <coughs> uh, I will allow members to do this before they ask questions to seek clarity. And then they will ask questions. Continue until all of you, you finish. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chair. I think just to recap and also to just summarize in terms of what we have said, uh, while we have got a, a good performance financially, we remain as an organization challenged for as long as the production in Mosul Bay is suspended. So, because we are carrying high fixed cost, so, and it is of paramount importance that we get that production reinstated, but it must be commercial so that it can sustain itself. So, that is what that low cash, because the, 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 the revenue that we get from sales is inadequate to carry the heavy fixed cost for uh, the fixed infrastructure, which I when you, w the reason for us that we must reinstate uh, our infrastructure and also produce commercially, it will enable us to play our role and contribute towards making sure that we are producing our own fuel and we are also reducing our vulnerability to what we are seeing with the exposure of imports coming into the country. Uh, next slide, sir. Can we go to the initiatives? Because the initiatives are trying to balance <coughs> that challenge. The first initiative being the Petro SA uh, turnaround, um, which is the reinstatement of the refinery. That is the first initiative. The second initiative that we're also driving is the FA platform reinstatement, as well as Block 9 well workovers, where Petro SA has uh, production rights in Block 9. It also includes the uh, advancement of the gas to power. It also includes it us uh, increasing the, the volumes, uh, continuing the path of increasing the volumes, but also looking at how else we can increase the margins, not just the volumes only, so that we can improve the business. And lastly, as we embark on this change, we also need to make sure that we are supporting the SANPC measure. So we are working hand in hand with that. We do have challenges in terms of the, which are contributors to the finances, which is we have uh, a DES a risk that we are managing uh, through the official channels with SAFs to make sure that we, we, that is properly dealt with. We have uh, demarrage, which is exacerbated by the issue of uh, prompt orders from one of our major customers, which is ESCOM, which does not enable us to operate where we can plan for three months ahead because we must respond immediately as soon as ESCOM requires uh, the, the requirements. That area, we, we are working uh, closely to make sure that we reduce it. We also need to look at the, 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 the payables for the accounts that we're bringing in. So those are all the financial pressures that we're focusing on. And as I indicated, with the fixed plant that is not producing economically, uh, and we have been uh, also to make sure that asset integrity is maintained, to make sure that you do not fail to, pro to provide a safe working place. We are seeing that you c there are items that you need to now do now. You can't uh, defer them further, and that puts additional pressure on operational costs. The, the priority projects which, um, uh, which anchor our turnaround strategy, it's three things really that are driving those, uh, is to make sure that we can leverage on on the assets that we have to generate revenue, 
and it is to also make sure that we could also leverage on the partnerships to bring in, uh, to reduce also the, the cost of capital. We're also clear from the mandate that we have uh, we, uh, that the asset of, uh, assets of Petro SA remain the assets of the state. So whatever we do is to make sure that we maximize utilization and improve return on investment on that asset. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide, uh, I have one disclaimer that there is just one item that is not showing. We went to cabinet in December. Cabinet did endorse us. That would have been under above five. Uh, where cabinet in December of 2023 endorsed us to continue with Gazprom Bank in terms of developing and reinstating that refinery. Uh, that is the process that we are embarking on. Uh, we are working with uh, Gazprom Bank Africa in terms of reinstating that refinery. Now, they, uh, uh, Gazprom Bank is at, at their own cost conduct uh, verifying all the technical data to conclude the, 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 the feasibility study. So they're incurring a cost. We as Petro SA are not really, are not paying them. And in that process, we're also finalizing the terms and conditions of the contract. Next slide. This slide just outlines the process that we've followed. As you can see, it's been quite a long process and we are continuing to move. We are challenged uh, with the, cause when we uh, got endorsement by cabinet in, uh, in December of 2023, uh, there's also, we will have to go back to cabinet uh, to, for the final investment decision. So at uh, the conclusion, at the application of the final investment decision, which talks to the uh, reinstatement capacity of the refinery, we, it must also be commercially viable. And because of that uh, question of, is this now commercially viable? That has taken, uh, uh, that has taken time to, to, to agree in terms of, our plan was to start with 18,000 and then ramp up to 36 and then ramp up to 46. The question was, if you go that process or you go straight from what you have to 18,000, with, uh, to 36,000 within the same timeline, you are more likely to get a much more commercially viable uh, solution. This is on the liquid section of the refinery. Uh, so that is really where we are. And we still anticipate that within the next couple of months, we will com complete that full technical evaluation. We can go to the next slide. The next slide just highlights the, the the relative order of magnitude of the scenarios we had uh, evaluated uh, and which were also part of what we had submitted for submission for approval, uh, which was uh, initially we were looking at 18,000, but 18,000 was not cutting in terms of the economics. So the economics uh, for it to be commercially viable, we were looking at something in between 18,000 and 36,000. That's the technical viability. So you can look at the capital that will be required to be invested in that infrastructure that we've estimated, which we are busy verifying. The phase two part will come at a much later stage because of the marketing uh, studies that need to inform that investment. Let's go to the next slide. This slide just talks to some of the technical work that we are busy with, with Gazprom Bank and Petro SA, which is we know that one of the contributing factors with uh, uh, demarrage in Mosul Bay, besides the prompt orders, is the fact that you have uh, flow restriction on the import facilities, which is the single boy mooring and the camp boy mooring, which is just off the coast of Mosul Bay, because uh, that uh, SPM and that CBM those pipelines have, uh, th th they are a bottleneck in terms of us being too able to discharge the vessel, which is unlike the rates that you see in Devon, where they could discharge at five to 10 times faster than us. So that's an area that when the refinery is uh, reinstated, we need to make sure that we can handle the products faster. It also affects that the refinery, while we are 
are busy rebuilding the refinery, we need to make sure that the, we, the imports are being properly handled in the tank farm, and that is the work that we're doing, because the, we, at, at, at a point in time, we would need to be able to evacuate the refinery scope. So what we're really looking at there is the interface between trading post the refinery commissioning. We're also looking at also in the space that is in the four by tank farm, what we can fully utilize. As we know that there are other areas where we can put up uh, additional tanks for us to be able to handle uh, the products in four by so that we do not sacrifice one project over the other but we can find solutions. So we've, uh, so those are all the technical uh, work that is done. I've just highlighted also the issue that uh, currently the, the, oil, the, the crude oil line that we currently have uh, where we, we were storing the, the, the condensate. We, would, we have repurposed that for the time being for handling finished product. So we would then need to look at all that infrastructure because those are modifications that we would have to do. Um, also, for us to improve the efficiency of running the refinery out of Mosel Bay, we need to be able to reconnect uh, moving product, evacuating product out of Mosel Bay through road, uh, through the Camboy, as well as through the rail that connects us to our depot in Bloemfontein. So those are the areas that the technical team, the joint technical team between Gazprom Bank Africa, as well as Petro SA is finalizing, which we must take into account the CAPEX, the terms of the, of the CAPEX that's required, the repayment period, uh, and so that we can finalize the uh, final investment decision, so that we can make sure that we have protected our interest while we are also advancing a solution. On the decommissioning liability, as I indicated, uh, in terms of our decommissioning uh, liability, that is the number that we currently have, uh, which is the 10.268. That is influenced by the dollar exchange rate uh, because the bulk of the services are offshore services and the bulk of the decommissioning liability is also offshore. So we are influenced, the two main drivers that influence also that number is the exchange rate as well as the crude oil price as the services are influenced by those two. We are also in the process continuously to look at uh, with the developments that are happening uh, globally, how do we review uh, that and also how do we uh, prepare in terms of making sure that we close the gap that we currently know we have. So that is the work that we are currently busy with. Um, we also understand that there has been from a NEMA compliance, there has been some uh, uh, extension in terms of the cutoff date. We've also, part of the work that we're doing in for continuous review of our data is uh, with uh, DNV, whom we've uh, appointed and with, uh, we've got that work underway and that is what we are busy with. Next slide. On the upstream, uh, concurrent to RFP 001, which I've spoken to extensively, uh, we had also RFP 003 as well as RFP 004. RFP 003 talks to Block 9 production. We know that in Block 9 we have remaining tail gas. We also have remaining uh, gas reserves that uh, for that uh, gas to be exploited as well as condensate from that block to be exploited, we need to sink extensive capital, which we do not have given our current cash position. So oh, the strategy that was uh, supported with by our board was for us to go out on competitive uh, process. And we did go out to the competitive process for block nine, uh, which is RFP 003. And that entails seven well workovers for us uh, to increase the, re, uh, the recovery of the remaining gas over and above the tail gas. And then also for us to reinstate the FA platform, uh, which was the funding from RFP uh, 004, which is the Equator Holdings. The 
ROP003 is Ikuteza. Now, the importance of us embarking on this project with the asset that has offshore, that is uh, switched off in a highly corrosive environment. It is slowly, uh, the asset integrity is slowly decaying. So the sooner you get production online, the sooner you then have the capital to be able to reinstate the asset itself and for the asset to be able to pay for itself. Uh, because that asset is not only important for Petro SA today, it's also important if we want to unlock the block 11, block, block 11B, block uh, 12B uh, fields, which are to be developed by, uh, yeah. by total led consortium, total energy led consortium. So this, this infrastructure is critical that it must be intact uh, for that to be unlocked. Yeah. And we anticipate that to come in, uh, in the, by 2030 or so. So we cannot allow the asset to rot when the asset is currently sitting on mineral resources that if the mineral resources that are there are extracted, they could be used to reinstate the asset maintain the asset and then uh, make the modifications. So for RFP003, through the process that we had embarked on, we that was awarded to Equiteza and RFP004, well, that is awarded to uh, Equator Holdings. Those agreements are similar to RFP001, where the respective partners are still also finalizing the business case for final investment decision. So it is a, an ongoing work program between the two before we can reach FID. So I think that is important. And we are, as the AG highlighted earlier on, when they presented saying that these areas would be under the, the audit program for the year, we would definitely welcome that, would open all our books uh, in terms of showing what process we had followed to be where we are today. Uh, next slide. I think the next slide just summarizes uh, some of the timelines in terms of where we are, some of the challenges that we've embarked on. Nothing is very uh, uh, simple. You will have challenges, and those are the challenges that we are battling with as we, we are embarking on this process. Um, so uh, let's go to the next slide. Similarly to RFP004, this is where we are, and uh, th that is the process where we are. Let's go to the next slide. On the gas trading, we've embarked on a gas trading as Petro SA. We are looking at anchoring uh, the, the gas trading at two levels, which is our role within the SEF group, which we are a smaller puzzle in terms of what uh, DMRE and SEF are doing to make sure that there is a stable gas economy. Our role and our agreement between Romco and uh, Romco, uh, non ENH, and Petro SA gas trading is for us to be able to first land the first two petrojoules uh, per annum into South Africa, so which is a joint ENH is an equivalent of Central Energy Fund in Mozambique. When we land that, it also unlocks uh, access to additional gas from Mozambique which ENH already has that's available. And it also talks to closing the gap where we've seen that in the country and, and Sasol had issued customers notification that they cannot secure them supply. And we've seen uh, gas users knocking at our doors for that. So our first landing of the first two million gigajoules through our JV with uh, uh, ENH is to is initially we lend the two million gigajoules, but it also advances to close the panic that is being anticipated by by the by the industrial gas users. But that only really is on the northern part, and it is important to differentiate between PetroSA gas trading, the uh, agreement between ENH, which is at the, at the back of a bilateral agreement between. Uh, uh, the government of Mozambique and, and government of South Africa, which is what has 
uh, being the backbone of making sure that we have a vibrant gas economy in the north. We have also, in that process, uh, received the, the gas trading license by, uh, by a notification that we have been granted the gas trading uh, license, which enables the group now to play its position in, 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 in closing that gap for supply, which also helps us uh, for re-engaging with, uh, with re -engaging with the consortium that's led by Total Energies uh, in terms of unlocking uh, Block 11, because we still need to make sure that we, uh, we, 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 the asset is, is, in, is intact, but we also need to unlock the, the gas sales uh, from uh, Brupada, because there's two things. It's the infrastructure that must be there, it is also the gas sales that will need to be backed up. So those, those advances in the gas trade, we are doing that in, in, in line with all the other activities around gas that are being led by SEF Group, uh, uh, led by SANPC. So there are other moving parts under gas, but from a gas trading point of view, this is where we are, and we anticipate that this gives us new revenue stream to try and close the gap that we have on the revenue shortfall. And we really need that uh, revenue stream from the gas trading as Petro SA. That is the last uh, comment. Thank you, thank you, Chen. Uh, greetings to everyone. From AE, I just thought I'll on the highlights, obviously, and then I'll mention some of the low lights or our challenges. The last quarter, we actually met the, the target that we are supposed to send to ESCOM for the very first time. The second highlight that I'll expand more on it is that we're looking at operationalizing our coal asset, which we have our mining rights for, within the first half of the year. So what we've achieved so far is that the team that 65% that you seeing, which is an expert, means we are mining our own coal. Basically, we, we have increased the, the geological information at the mine at Plaquefontein, and we have since the increased our own mining, or our own coal from our own source. The last highlight that I need to mention, which is very technical, is just that if you have those yellow machines working at your mine, at 85% utilization is one of the best that the mine can achieve, but we've actually in that year achieved 86.7. One of the challenges that I really want to highlight is that the coal qualities have been identified, obviously by increasing drilling and expanding the geological model. The Kusile limitation, I think that Currently, Kusile has improved. They, when this was compiled last year, Kusile was running on three units. There are now five, looking at six. So hopefully that limitation will also be sorted. But credit to ESCOM, when Kusile was bottlenecked, they allowed us to go to other power stations, which is Kendal, Majuva, and so on and so on. Next slide, please. So, Jay, here I want to concentrate on the block, and I hope it's substance. Now, the 40, you, you see the revenue has improved, the gross profit has improved, the net profit by 11%, cash 330, which is obviously 264. So I thought this is the slide that I must talk from the heart. Forget the numbers, let's talk what happened. Before the audit period, AE was a 50,000 ton per month average, which was 800,000. That led to threat of ESCOM terminating the CSA, the coal supply agreement, because we are not meaning, meeting the minimum requirements of 134,000. Now, what you see there is we moved from 50,000 tons per month to 200,000 tons per month, which is during the year that the audit happened. And I'm emphasizing this because that happened because we had a lot of 
private sector qualified people coming into AE. And some of the decisions that were made were partly, slightly, call it because of the lack of understanding of PFMA, but in all fairness was in the best interest of stabilizing the, the company. You have, we, we, we have mentioned the war room in this discussion earlier. AE was in the war room, A is no longer in the war room. And that is <coughs> obviously because of the contribution that you've seen in the revenue. So with the next slide, please, sorry. So, and go to the next one, the audit findings, yeah. So I think a lot have been said about AE, but I just want to give obviously the, the perception that it might not be fully explained. We've said with the AE, and we agreed on that there's a matter in dispute, which was obviously the audit, but we have since moved on. In that day, Clamela said it, we are now co-developed the audit plan. We've got joint workshops. And uh, I think when the SEM manager wasn't there, the CFO wasn't there, we all know what was going to happen. But subsequent to that, we now have a CFO, we now have a SEM manager, and we're hoping most of the findings are going to be sorted out in the next uh, financial year. Next slide, please. So talking about strategic outlook, if you remember that slide on the cash flow, we, we now say in developed future coal supplies. That is possible because the money that we generated, we actually started using our own money to improve our geological maps for one Klepworki, which is another mining right we have, T project, and also Flakfontein. So the number that you see in there, six million tons per annum supply to ESCOM, comes from validated geological information from the three mining rights that we have. We're hoping to have two of them up and running, T project next year. And then the second one is future minerals. We've also spent our own money. Bila Bila, we've now drilled and did geoscience and seismic for rare earth and tin. We've done the same thing in Northern K for manganese and iron ore. So, Basically, what we're trying to be is to be the government mining champion and using our own funds. We don't want to go back to treasurer or to fiscal and start using the money. Where it's necessary, you see, we've mentioned in the, the partnership, and obviously that's because of the technology in some cases won't be able to fulfill. Or where the, the new hype with the battery minerals, we know that technology is not available in the country. So we're looking at opening up and having people we can do. We've also mentioned the operational excellence. One example is the one that I mentioned of 86% availability. Unfortunately, we do have one mine, and that's the only differentiator that we can use. But having said that, when we were pushing 50 tons per month, the cost to mine per ton before we sent stuff to ESCOM was around 1,002. Now our rent per ton cost is down to 350, which is something that we think contributes to our operational excellence. And we want to copy paste that practice to clip work it to treat T projects and other mines. The last one that we also want to mention is we want to become the res responsible corporate citizens. Citizen. That basically we acknowledge that we needed to get out of the war room. We needed to stabilize the company. And we've done that. The second is working with the age, working with the DMRA, and, or, and uh, any other stakeholders, by the way, to fulfill the other elements or parameters that obviously affect AE. I think this is where I'd like to finish it, sir. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, um, Honorable Chair. Um, good afternoon, Honorable Members, uh, Honorable Minister, and colleagues. I will try to be pretty brief um, on the SFF. Um, in terms of the highlights and the lowlights, the highlights um, we want to mention is that um, we managed to secure 50% of BP Montague Gardens and in Cape Town. 
and this works well with our sister company, Petro SA, to be able to be in a better position to supply ESCOM with diesel in the Western Cape. Uh, the second one, uh, construction of um, LPG um, pipeline from the berth to the facilities that we bought. Um, we managed to get approval from NASA to be able to build that pipeline, and we think that's a good um, achievement. Um, the third one, uh, we bought 60% uh, of Avedia uh, terminal in West in Saldana, um, and this is actually to be able to bring LPG. You might remember that um, in the last few years, every winter, Western Cape actually runs out of LPG chair, and I think as a state-owned entity, we felt that this is a critical intervention uh, to be able to make sure that we service uh, the citizens in this province. Uh, Chair, in terms of the low lights, um, you may remember that when this committee came in, one of the big headaches that we spent a lot of time on was the sale of strategic stock. Um, what we had to do, we spent three and a half years to four years in court um, with the traders. Um, we managed to win the case. Um, the sale was reversed. And um, as a result of that, the court also felt that uh, we need to pay out of pocket expenses. Um, and the hedge loss plus uh, all the interest was about 2.3 billion rands, and uh, we had to pay that as SFF. But I, I, th I think it's also with underlying the fact that the stock was sold at $28 per barrel. We got it back, and at today's price, that stock is worth $885 per barrel. So you're talking $280 million versus $850 million. So clearly it was worth a fight to get that stock, although we had to incur um, the hash loss. The other low light is that, um, you know, um, that stock actually helped to carry the nation in April, May last year when the cost of fuel was pretty high, we had to actually sell stock and pay treasury six billion rent. Um, because the oil price started cooling off um, and went down, we could not sell, so we had to negotiate with treasury to defer the date of the payment. In terms of the income statement, the next slide. Um, um, Chair, we reported a loss of um, 342 um, million rands, uh, but the context is what I earlier spoke to. Um, you know, prior to 2.3 billion that we had to pay, because that came direct from the, our PNL, um, we would have uh, set with a profit of uh, 1.92 billion rands. So um, it was, although um, we uh, had to pay that amount of money. Uh, but there is impact on the balance sheet because we managed to get title of that stock uh, back to the Republic of South Africa. The next slide, please. We continue to work with AG um, and uh, Honorable Chair, normally we uh, say to ourselves that uh, before the next audit, we need to have dealt with the previous findings and clear them because that's where AG normally starts. And in 22, 23, uh, we had four findings and we continue to work on that. The next slide, please. And those findings, Chair, are a material misstatement of performance report. Um, this was actually discussed with management and was subsequently uh, cleared. Um, the annual statements um, report, uh, we had the issue of uh, rehabilitation provision and goodwill that we had to reassess after um, the number of years. The problem that we then had was at the time of submitting the financials, uh, we had not report, um, received the rehabilitation assessment from the external expert and the goodwill. And when those came through, actually they changed the numbers a bit, but we had since recorded a corrected that as well. Chair, in terms of the oversight and governance, um, one finding is that we had a bit of a challenge in three months, 
of three months period where we did not have um, the board because the previous board uh, term had expired, uh, but um, we had since corrected that. And actually that was one of the findings purely related to uh, risk and audit committee. And in terms of the internal control chair, um, it's worth mentioning that after the acquisitions, um, this was the first time we consolidate um, Avedia into our books. Um, unfortunately, it took a lot of time with the competition commission. Um, and um, when the approval came through, it was in March already. Um, and what we did not anticipate is AG will deal with it that uh, same year. Um, and actually that created a bit of a challenge, but we believe that we have uh, managed to get our hands around it. Uh, we don't expect that to happen again. Next slide, please. Chair, in terms of our strategic outlook, um, there are four buckets that we tend to focus on. One is, um, you know, to be prepared for supply disruption. Um, we had inc incidents where we ran out of crude um, in this country. We had to supply um, refinery in the inland um, with crude to make sure that the country continues um, to have a supply of hydrocarbon. Um, so we believe that we are the supplier of last resort um, and we continue to focus on that. Uh, the second one, we believe that we should be striving to be independent of financial support from the state. Um, you know, um, so far, so good, and we continue to focus on that. Uh, the third one, Chair, is um, transformation imperative needs to be focused on. Um, as a state-owned entity, of course, um, is our role um, to support the government's direction. And the last one, of course, um, we always think of our stakeholders and our aspiration is actually to um, exceed um, uh, stakeholders' um, expectation. Um, and Chair, that will be a short story around SFF um, and we will then um, change gear and move to the conversation um, around the merger. Chair, we, we, we've come a long way. Um, you know, it has been um, three years since we started talking about the merger. Um, obviously, um, some delays around some approvals. Um, and, um, you know, we're actually working on uh, 51, 54 approvals um, to make sure that um, we are good to go. Uh, but some of the elements of the merger um, have progressed uh, very well. Um, steady progress, uh, but we are focusing on uh, transition implementation milestones. Um, and at this stage, we are in the box in the middle, um, which is um, fair value assessment of the assets, which are going to be leased uh, from the legacy entities uh, to SNPC. Um, and we're also focusing on uh, employee transition uh, planning. Um, in terms of just going forward here, um, the next thing that we need to do is make sure that we finalize um, the transfer of assets, uh, we finalize the capacitation of SNPC, um, we bring the employees across uh, to the new entity, and um, our deadline on that chair is um, August um, of this year. And I think it's just worth mentioning that, Chair, not only is this uh, part of our uh, performance contract, uh, but is um, you know, in the scorecard of our Honorable Minister. So we collectively <laughs> own it um, to make sure that it's delivered, Chair. And I think when we come back, we'll talk more about this measure, and I think there will be a lot of news around that. Chair, I thank you on that, and I'll hand over to um, Sefsok. Thank you, Chair. So thank you very much, Chair, and the honorable members. Uh, last part of the presentation, and I'll move quite quickly as well. Chair, I think in terms of the SEFSOC, I think highlights, um, I think the main one was really around the cabinet approval for uh, enabling us to move to phase two 
uh, of the merge implementation, finalization of the, the, the ROM code deal, and uh, key initiatives around the operating model and structure changes to support uh, the CEF SOC's new role of being a strategic investor, as well as other, I think, key initiatives in terms of, from an oversight perspective, which have been alluded to, uh, one that being uh, uh, the war room uh, to support the turnaround and key decision-making initiatives um, for, for the turnaround of PetroSA. There were, however, uh, I think a, a few lowlights, um, ones related to the delays with execution uh, and the closure of key, I think, priority investments, um, as well as what we are seeing in the, uh, I think, in the, in the industry in terms of the role of multinationals, um, trying to, to limit the role of state participation uh, across the entire value chain, which has significant impact in terms of our, uh, what we call the group growth agenda uh, from an investment perspective. Chair, I won't go into a lot of detail because I on this one because I think Group CFO had touched on it uh, in terms of our role, the CIFSOC, as a holding um, company, but also executing on our printing strategy, uh, which is really uh, focused around uh, key initiatives for the period under review were SNPC enablement and uh, as well as uh, uh, you know, business development. But suffice to say that for the period under review, generated a net profit of 169 million rand. And what underpins that is one is, um, you know, underspending, which also signals uh, the delay in terms of our project execution. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, the high, um, you, know, you know, interest income, uh, which is to be noted in a, in a high uh, interest rate uh, regime period. Um, that's our analysis, Chair, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the key audit findings, I think, for the period. And uh, we have closed a total of eight uh, uh, audit findings accumulatively uh, for the past two financial years. And we continue to work uh, very closely with the AG to implement a number of the key recommendations uh, that have been given to, to CEFSOC as a holding company. Uh, two major, I think, uh, in a, a critical audit findings. One is the financial statements uh, relating to material uh, mis uh, statements. And, of course, uh, the, the supporting action plan relates to the IFRS uh, training offered uh, to the finance team uh, in relation to the preparation of interim and financial statements. And then the annual performance uh, report. Um, the process was implement, uh, implemented to lock the performance information you know, at year end and to prevent improper retrospective changes. What we'd also have done, uh, Chair, is we have subsequently acquired an automated business performance management system that will enable uh, much uh, more tighter controls in terms of the overall group performance management initiatives. Chair, just I think in closing then, looking at the overall uh, self group strategic outlook, um, you know, just touching on, I think, the key global trends and scenarios that, uh, that have a significant impact on our open environment that, we that we've been tracking from 2022, 2023, as, as well as their, their possibility of impacting not only the strategic, but also our operational initiatives. It's just an overview of key drivers in our operating environment, and some of those we also take key um, planning, uh, key initiatives uh, that will also impact, uh, you know, the strategic outlook, uh, you know, for the, you know, for the SEF group as a whole. In the group CEO's opening slide, he spoke about um, uh, the three strategic horizons that underpin the SEF group. We have just um, gone past what we call the reset phase, which was essentially a back to basics. We are now pivoting as part of the next uh, strategic uh, horizon to our, to our next horizon of scaling up for growth, which is uh, Chair, essentially um, a business growth focused uh, strategic horizons where the focus will be on uh, strategic partnership and investments, um, revenue uh, diversification, as well as uh, portfolio di diversification, innovation, forward and backward integration, uh, related initiatives as part of supporting the overall group growth agenda. 
uh, in, in enclosing uh, in terms of the six core areas that the CEF group would be focusing on, of course, being driven by the scaling up for growth uh, initiatives, a lot of investment, uh, you know, through strategic partnerships. Uh, I think as outlined by uh, Petro SA, uh, an acting CEO, the, the stabilization and turnaround of Petro SA will still uh, remain central in terms of the group's uh, strategic initiatives. And embedded in that, of course, is the reinstatement of the GTL, um, the, the need to improve the overall project execution right across the Federation so that we can then be able to achieve uh, the target financial results that underpin our long-term commercial sustainability objectives, cementing and strengthening strategic partnerships, and also lastly, um, execution of the, of the merger project as outlined uh, by Mr. Moachie. With that, Chair, I'll then hand back to Group CEO. Thank you very much. We'll hand over to the Minister. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, that is our presentation. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, with the powers vested in me, please. Can you take a five-minute stretch play break? Come back exactly at 28 minutes uh, past 12. Thank you.
Quatro. Quatro. Zakale lango ba o accounta pa kum. Can we start the meeting? Kamaikel. And Zoom seven, and Zoom seven, Maka Michael, Maka Michael, and Zoom seven, Zako Jong won to Nanko Luka and Ronhosh. Yes, I'm glad. Yes, I'm glad. The two Kamaikel, Magazum seven, Zako Jong won to Nanko Luka and Ronhosh. Okay. Honorable members, I allowed this presentation to go as thorough um, as possible. This, in my view, will help, one, those members who might be fortunate uh, to be coming back for the seventh parliament, but also be in the same committee. At least they will have what I would call a specialized institutional memory but also at the same time, it will assist uh, for those who may not be coming back to have a legacy knowledge and understanding of what is the current state of affairs. Uh, <coughs> Honorable Minister, I can do it because I'm going to say that 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 I'm going the <laughs> <laughs> okay, on that note, honorable members, uh, let me now give opportunities to honorable members to ask questions of clarity. But also, you must know now you have been here for the past five years, and uh, the knowledge that you have amassed. I think we have reached that stage where you can even throw some words of wisdom. Uh, <coughs> there, they know when a, a boy is coming from the mountains, there is a time where the old men are allowed to throw some words of wisdom to welcome him to manhood. So with your experience, uh, that's why I was joking and saying, uh, Mr. Moache will say Anse is an ancestor here because he's one of the only familiar faces I remember when we came in in 2019. <coughs> With his friend, just say I said when I'm leaving, hi. Uh, very good, eloquent English. Uh, I hope you're still in the establishment, uh, Mr. Zono. Uh, uh, on that note, honorable members, I see the hand of honorable Mailem, honorable Malinga, honorable Masaule, honorable Volmarans, in that order. Thank you, Chairperson. Chairperson, um, I have a number of questions because it's a lengthy presentation, so I hope you'll just be patient with me. Um, I will try and be as brief as possible. But before I do that, I'd like to just make one comment. And that is, I'd like to draw the Minister's attention to Section 92.2 of the Constitution, which says that members of the Cabinet are collectively and individually accountable to Parliament. I didn't say they were accountable to me, I said to Parliament. And they are accountable for the exercise of their performance and their their functions. So I'm just drawing that to your attention. Parliament does hold you accountable. Uh, Chairperson, I'm going to start with 
uh, Ms. Noah's comments, and I, I'm not sure if I should address this to you or to the minister, and it relates to something that you spoke about. You spoke about the appointment of Mr. Kolile Sazani as the CEO of PetroSA. And my question is this, what process was followed in his appointment? Specifically, did he go through the same process as all the other candidates that went through an interview process, a shortlisting process, et cetera, before he was appointed? And I want to stress, I'm not calling into question his suitability for the job at all. I'm asking about the process that was followed. My next question is for the group CFO, Ms. Morabe, and it's on slide 18. Um, at the bottom of slide 18, it says, in 2023, the net asset value increased due to net profit generated, where is Ms. Morabe? At the back. Um, generated for the year. But if I look at the graph, it appears as though the um, net asset value is essentially static. So I'd just like some clarity on that. Then on slide 19, now you spoke about how the 2.7 billion rand um, of decommissioning liability was, was reclaimed, for want of a better word, uh, as income. Um, b because of recalculation. I'd like to know how that recalculation was done and what the, the impact will be going forward given that you're not going to have that, that recalculation in future years. In this year, if you did not have that recalculation of decommissioning liability at Petro's A, Seth would have made a one point something billion rand loss. So I'd like some clarity on that. Um, then, if we can move on to Petro SA itself, I, I do have concerns about Petro SA's solvency, particularly uh, their going concern status. Um, that remains an issue for me. Uh, and, and maybe this, I don't know if this goes to the group CFO or to who, but as we go through this presentation, there's no standardization of the way that the accounts are presented. So some people present a balance sheet, some people present an income statement, and some people present a cash flow. And it doesn't help if you're trying to look at the, the, the group and all the different entities, if you're looking at different formats of of, uh, document, uh, or, or of financial accounts. And my last point on that, is that on the balance sheet of, of the group, and I think that was on page 19, you only show half the balance sheet. So we, we only have, is it 19, page 19? Oh, no, sorry, page, yeah, page 19. You only show us uh, the asset side of the balance sheet. We don't see anything as to the liabilities side of the balance sheet. So. That's problematic for me. If you show a balance sheet, you need to show the whole balance sheet. Um, okay. On Petrese, where to start? So perhaps the, 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 the starting point has to be, and I'm going to address this to the acting CEO, Ms. McGardler. Uh, on the downstream initiatives on page 41, on slide 41. My concern is that this is not an area where PetroSA has any real expertise. I've raised this before, that you're playing in a completely new market and it's one that, that PetroSA has no capacity, no expertise, no knowledge of, um, and I'm curious as to why you think that you can do this better than the existing players in that market, which is already a very overtraded market, the downstream uh, petroleum sector. So I'm, I'm curious about that. I'm also curious about, and, I, and now we can get to now we can get to it. On on slide 44, when we talk about the GTL reinstatement and the capex requirements, one of the objectives or targets in the bottom right hand corner 
is that you're going to move from a 46,000 barrel per day production to a 450,000 barrel per day production. Given that the biggest challenge and the, the reason why the GTL plant has shut down is a lack of feedstock, where is that coming from? Where is that feedstock coming from to meet that demand? Uh, okay, and then on page 47, so here we have RFP 0004, well, RFP 0003 and 0004, and I'd really like to know how Equator Holdings was appointed. Given that your tender requirements necessitated that they have a track record in the energy or oil sector, that was a requirement, or that they be a financial institution, and that they have a term letter saying that they could put up the 21.6 billion rand that you, Petro SA, estimated would be required. So how did they get through all of those hoops to be appointed as the preferred bidder? Also noting that in RFP 0001, they were excluded because they, and, and I think the wording was, uh, their authenticity could not be verified. Now how can they go in RFP 0001 from not being an authentic player to RFP 0004 where now they are and they, they just bypass the requirements that are in the tender process. The words that you used were a competitive tender process. Well, that hardly seems competitive if, if we can throw the rules out the window and appoint who we like. And that goes to the next page, on page 48, where you say, work presented to date by Equiteza is not inspiring confidence that they can deliver. Well, Minister, here's the problem. When you have people that don't have a track record, when you have a company that doesn't have a track record, when you have a company that doesn't have finances, don't wave your hand at me, that doesn't have, a, uh, doesn't have finances, then they're not going to be able to deliver. So I question the decision-making processes, the vetting processes that are being employed at, at Petro SA. And I think that there's a huge problem here, that, that you're not doing your due diligence in terms of people that are bidding that they changed the scope of work from, from gas to oil. What gives them the right to change the scope of work? These are huge issues. I have a number of other concerns with regard to PetroSA, not least of which is the demurrage costs and the, the, um, your, your international business. I mean, uh, Ghana, where you have a minority shareholding. How is it possible that you have a whole division that is devoted to Ghana when you have a minority stake in the business. It doesn't make sense. Your aviation fuel division is running at a loss. Not even at, it's not even breaking even, it's running at a loss. And part of the problem, CEO, is that I'm working off a presentation I don't have any proof that what's in this presentation is accurate. So I really need to see the audited financial statements so I can drill down into these things. But just working off this, I've picked up a number of irregularities and financial concerns. And honestly, I think Petro SA needs to take a good look at itself and decide, and Minister, it's your responsibility, your department's responsibility as a shareholder to take a good look at, at Petro SA and decide whether or not it is viable. Because what I'm seeing is that the decision making, the processes that, that are unfolding, the, the financials that are being presented are not credible. And this is a huge problem for me. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll, I'll leave uh, some of the issues to Honorable Mashaule to, to deal with. I know he's quite capable. 
Uh, Chair, let me start with the remarks also of the SEF group, uh, Manoa. I think the Shamboking worked. Because if you remember, when we started in 2019, Minister, we were just uh, surprised at the parenting of SEF as a group. Uh, I remember our first meeting, Chair, I think it was in 514 five, or 515, five, whereby the, the GCO at the time, the man with the chain, the cross chain, hey, that man lied to us in Gongoshe, hey. But uh, I'll leave that. Also, Chair, I want to assure the Minister that we do see progress from the SEF group. It's not that we, we are anti-progress. We appreciate the progress that we have seen from all the entities under the SEF group from 2019 up to date. GCO, um, I know that you are not a man of many words, but we see your actions. Uh, please rain on AEMFC like the minister is advising. I think they need help, but I am also happy, Chair, that they have now appointed a CFO who needs to strengthen their own internal audit uh, component within the, the AEMFC. Chair, I also want the GCO to further explain, because I know that this was just the AG uh, responding to your question on the terminology domain. Why are those entities or companies listed there dormant? Uh, and why keep them dormant? Are they profitable? Because I think uh, the gentleman at the back from the AG said they, they um, finances are in order, but why are they dormant? Chair, uh, um, also to Petro SA, if we could be briefed on the issue of Petro SA and Equator Holdings uh, so that we understand what is happening there. Chairperson also serve to appraise the committee on the Gobodo investigations because I see here the, the former CEO and those executives, they went to CCMA, how far is the process and uh, do you see any positive results from, from, from there? Minister, on the issue, lastly, Chairperson, my, my last point will be on the issue of the measure. How, how, how are we doing? Uh, how far are we? And when can we realize the results on the measure of, I guess, Petro SA and SFF? Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and greetings again. Uh, let me start by disagreeing with the Minister um, that this committee does not appreciate progress. It's wrong. It's not, it's not the case. Uh, when we were dealing with the AG, I did comment that uh, from 2019, up until today, we have moved uh, on a positive trajectory and we, are, we have achieved a lot. And in these presentations, there are things that we think are progress, including the one that yourself and Honorable Malem were talking about around the fictitious company. You know, the fact that <clears throat> The issue of the fictitious company was actually detected by an internal audit and you did not sweep it under the carpet. It's a positive that you are opening up to saying to us, here are things that are wrong and we are reporting to them as an accounting uh, body. That needs to be commended, Minister, and it's one of the things that we are saying you are wrong when you say we don't appreciate uh, we don't appreciate the good work that you have done. One thing that we will request from uh, <clears throat> the minister is that 
in the seventh administration, because I believe you are coming back, um, report on this matter, uh, on progress that would have been made in this regard. That's one thing. The second issue on acknowledging positive things that uh, the department has been doing. You see, if you go to that slide of uh, the major, it, it, it shows you where we're coming from and where we're going. And it says soon enough we're going to uh, 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 be signing. Uh, of course, you need to deal with the transition of staff, reposition the organization, uh, and uh, I'm not sure whether it's you, um, uh, CEO uh, or chair, uh, who introduced the new CEO of uh, the National um, uh, uh, Petroleum Company. It's a positive trajectory that when you look back from 2019, like Honorable Malinga was saying, it was very traumatic to listen to Seth, just to listen to Seth presenting. And I won't mention names like she, she, she did. But that's a positive uh, trajectory uh, on the positives that you, you have made. We have made a call to the minister that uh, AE needs to start moving towards diversifying its business and not stick to coal. Today we got a report that they are moving towards that to an extent where they are even contemplating to enter the African continent. That's progress we are, we are, we are, we are appreciating, Minister. That's why we are saying you are wrong. Uh, uh, if that's not uh, appreciating, I don't know what uh, it will be. Having said that uh, about AE, um, and let's go to, is it AE that, uh, okay, I'll come back to AE. Let's go to page 20, Twenty, okay, 19, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Okay. Is that 19? That's 18. Can we go to 19 where on the right side, it speaks about the, the group reported total assets, blah, 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 blah. the increase is mainly due to, I'm interested in aqua additional investment of 70 million, an aqua loan advance of 210 uh, million, CMG loan advance of two billion, can can we be taken through what does what 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 does it mean um, from a layman's point of view? Who do not understand investments? Can we get an expansion of what that means uh, from uh, the person who was uh, presenting? Now, page twenty-seven. Um, the, I would appreciate it if it was to be, so that all of us see what we are talking about on the strategic direction and outlook. So on number one, commercial sustain sustainability, the last point was just read to say board approved implementation plan to exit OMA. What is OMA? 
um, uh, from where I'm sitting, I would want to know what, is, what are you exiting from? And uh, as much as you have mentioned it, I don't know what it is. And can we please uh, try and clarify that? Uh, page 47. Just a minute. Oh, I think uh, Honorable Malinga asked about the the project on uh, Equator, on how far it is. But I think the presenter took some time uh, giving us uh, information on that. I will pass on that one, uh, Chair. I had just noted it. Uh, Petro SA, uh, page 50. Now, Minister, the, the Minister of uh, Electricity mentioned in a press conference that uh, they want to move from expensive diesel generated electricity to gas. And here, as Petro SA, you are recording or reporting that part of the um, profits come from the sale of diesel to ESCOM. How is that going to affect uh, Petro SA's profit? It does say uh, Petro SA and ENH to have a face-to-face -face meeting, amongst other things, to address the market demand. More off-takers need gas. Is Petro SA, is ESCOM uh, uh, part of the, those off-takers? If that is the case, then it means we have covered the, the part where uh, uh, ESCOM goes low on uh, diesel and then you are part of the people who are considered to still sell uh, and do business with uh, uh, ESCOM. Page 58. Chair, I'm, I'm rounding up. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, the red, po the red uh, point two uh, on the low light says, due to the declining oil price, SFF was not able to settle the six billion to National Treasury by 31 March 2023. Discussions have, have been held with National Treasury to shift the time frame to a period where the oil prices increase. What does that mean? And uh, uh, um, if we were to predict the, 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 the level in which you envisage to say, this is our comfortability in the increase of oil prices um, on our discussions with the, with the National Treasury, and how much would that uh, translate to uh, uh, if you were to make that prediction? Lastly, on uh, page 64, uh, there is a sentence there that uh, always disturbs me, but uh, what can we do? Minister, we went to the UK for a study tour, and uh, part of what uh, we received in parliament, uh, different parliamentarians, different political parties, and, and what they agreed on is that in the UK, they, they have a budget for uh, fighting what you call um, NGOs that uh, are enemies to progress. I will call them that. They, they actually budget for that. Um, 
And the sentence here says, the role of multinationals in minimizing state participation across key areas of the energy value chain. Is it our considered view that, uh, or is there a relationship with the, uh, on the, these NGOs that I'm mentioning with the multinationals and their role in this regard? Um, and if there is, why are we not taking the model of uh, the UK to set aside uh, a considerable budget to deal with uh, institutions that uh, their, their job is just to minimize the state participation in uh, key areas of the energy value chain. Um, we have seen um, uh, investments done in terms of exploration, and then uh, uh, some people come to parliament outside with billboards toy toy that it will harm the, 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 the environment, fracking will harm the environment, and so forth. When we went to the UK, a professor, and we are still going to debate that report, told us that we must never shy away from fracking. But you need engineers that are going to make sure you frack the right way. You just frack the right way by, you must never be under an illusion that fracking is not part of development. So if this part can be clarified, Chair, and we see uh, where can we go in the next uh, uh, administration if we get an opportunity to um, lead the country again. Because uh, that study, if it's ab adopted there by the, 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 the National Assembly, part of what you must be doing is implementing what Parliament would have uh, agreed on as a report. Thank you very much. No, thanks, um, Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, Honorable Minister and uh, the team from DMRE, including the SEF group and its leadership, Chair. After um, <clears throat> Uh, Honorable Mathaule has uh, made his input and questions. I'm, I'm left with almost nothing, Chair. But I would like, with almost, <laughs> but for purposes of uh, um, the presentations, I welcome the presentation from, from SEF. In fact, I welcome both uh, presentations from the SEF group and uh, from the AG, because in, in both the presentations, uh, I could find and see some commonality, but I, will al uh, I could also see a complementary role that uh, this played. Now, uh, before it escapes my mind, <clears throat> uh, on this um, page 64, uh, or is it slide 54? The mention of, I would, I would have wanted the, the, the group to, to elaborate on the question of the multinationals. Um, um, and my question was not going to be around whether the NGOs and so on. It was going to be around the big businesses which, which might hamper us and it, which, in which way do they hamper us in as far as um, minimizing or obstructing our participation across all the areas as mentioned in that, um, uh, in that value chain. So it might not necessarily be the NGOs as stipulated, but uh, if it's big businesses and or other governments or multinationals, I would just like um, um, a take on that from, 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 from the group. A couple of years ago, we, 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 we were at pains to get clarity or to get a clear picture um, out of the affairs of the group 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis a lot of issues with respect to uh, vacancies, the, the boards, um, that, that global uh, or outside factors, um, and possible turnarounds within the, um, the group itself. So my take is notwithstanding the findings um, uh, as reported, uh, especially in some, uh, sub, uh, some subsidiaries uh, from the group, the group acquitted itself well, in my opinion. There's a lot, a lot of improvement, and the scenario uh, looks um, um, uh, positive. Uh, AE has been mentioned, um, and uh, I think they have, uh, to some extent, explained um, what is happening around there and how they got into where they are. But on a positive, um, we, we were bemoaning uh, in 2020 whether AE is it prepared to stand as a bystander there uh, looking at what is happening in the mining environment where they should be participating fully. And from their presentation, it shows that they have taken that into account and they are dating their hands in the field. I was still saying they were, they were supposed to be uh, set aside for them uh, to that extent and other, other entities, which I still believe we must have set aside uh, for, for entities that belong to government. So I can, I can see a positive shoot in as far as that environment where they are getting in, they are saying they are dealing with ESCOM, they are saying they are dealing with the coal matter and going beyond. So we see that um, uh, they are in there. So finally, Chair, without belaboring a lot of points, on page 23 of the AGES uh, submission, uh, there are about four points there. And those points, uh, if you take all the presentations and take them away, get rid of them and look at those points, they give you confidence in the trajectory that uh, the, the group is having with the support from the department. So it gives me also solace and a positive way forward in as far as uh, how the group has performed what it is doing uh, uh, to, to remedy the identified uh, deficiencies, and uh, they've got a well round up um, uh, opinion on how they are going to do their turnaround and where we are at the moment. So I want to agree with the part uh, where the AG in particular um, uh, says it looks positive, um, uh, it, we, need to take, we need to take care of issues that relate to AE in particular going forward, but generally um, it is a, 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 positive, a positive picture that um, I got from, from, the, from the submissions and the presentations. Thanks, Chair. Okay, Honorable, I'm very quick, just that one issue, and then we'll give to the Minister and Sir. Thank you, Chair. I don't want you to be angry with me. No, 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 it's just one quick question. Parliament. One okay. quick question. On slide 53, uh, AMFC, uh, I'm concerned about the employee costs line. It goes from 64 million in 2022 to 104 million in 2023. That's a massive, massive increase. Um, could I get an explanation as to why that is, please? Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much, uh, honorable members and uh, the minister. Um, we'll uh, take account as the executive authority with the entities under. Just a few issues, honorable minister. <coughs> you know, there's only one thing that I like as a chair, and that one, it must be known. I like power, and I don't play with it. I don't. So, one thing I can't do is to deprive myself. Uh, I don't want to do what Amilka Karpral said. I claim no easy victories. If we don't appreciate the progress at SAF and NEXA in particular, they are not here today, but at SAF, it's like pointing at you when three other fingers are pointing at us. So if we don't see that progress itself, it means as a portfolio committee indirectly we failed. 
So we will claim that victory because that progress itself is as a result also of the work that this committee has done in terms of oversight. So <clears throat> uh, we are not only claiming, we, we are not only claiming dealing with what was not good. When the results are there to speak, we must also claim it and not should change the work that has been doing. But I will come to that one much more late. I think because we are here, Honorable Minister, just very quick on just three issues that may not have been highlighted here, even if it's not going into details to them. One, I think uh, Honorable Maushaule has touched on it. Let me start with it. The relationship between Petro SA, to be specific, and uh, ESCOM. I'm raising this thing because in the public domain, it has been something that has been going on. Uh, because I'm a rural person, eh? let me use my rural English, second language. <coughs> there is a perception that has been made, or sometimes even at the highest level of the executive, that Petro SA is charging uh, ESCOM more when it comes to diesel. The question will be, is there a contractual arrangement between ESCOM or what is the bidding process? Is there a special arrangement between the two entities? That's my first issue, if we can get clar just a clarity on that one. The second one, and I think it's unfortunate the AG seemed has not picked this up. Uh, we are told those you will know in mining you call it an old order, right? There is an old order insurance that used to exist which is supposed to be accounted for by Petro SA. The reason I was asking that question even on dormant companies, I had expect, looked at it and I thought maybe that will fall under those dormant companies and which is why I had an interest that it does it generate income? If it does, has there anything that has been received by Petro SA? If so, is it what it's supposed to be equal? It's out there even in the social media. So I think that's, if we can get clarity on this issue of the old order insurance, let me pr prefer to use that word. The last issue, just a recap, what is the status of the South Sudan project. If, for me, if those issues, uh, I'm, that's why I said I don't think we need to go into details, but just to appraise this committee so that uh, the next uh, committee in the seventh parliament, when it deals with the minutes and matters arising, it would see that these issues were there. Honorable Minister. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, thank you very much. First of all, it is reassuring that uh, the Portfolio Committee appreciates progress. <laughs> it is reassuring. I want to leave it at that. Okay. This is reassuring uh, that you really appreciate progress. Let me start off by emphasizing what we are focusing on, because with all these entities, we work as a team. We get together regularly. We talk to one another as regular as we can without the minister being operational. Uh, when we went in there, one of the things we emphasized was that let's normalize governance uh, so that the minister cannot be getting his hands all the time. Once you put governance in place, what happens is that you reduce both operational and financial risk in entities. And I can tell you, Chairperson, that that is factual now. I always theorized it, it's factual now. That you normalize governance, you allow those boys to do trial and error, commit mistakes. Uh, when you have an opportunity to stand on top of the mountain, you shout at them, but they do the work. And they do the actual oversight of entities. And the minister report, receive reports regularly, and, and we do ask difficult questions to them. 
Uh, our focus has been to build the capacity of the state. Uh, that is a deliberate act on our part uh, at a time when it is just too modern to develop private sector capacity. In our, in our department, we are conscious about building capacity of the state because we have a belief, we have convinced one each other that building a capable state makes the private sector operate better. A weak state collapses the private sector. Uh, we believe in that. That's why, for example, uh, Chairperson will find that we, are quiet, we increased our shareholding in Romco, we acquired a Vidya, uh, we are shareholder of Aqua, the Redstone project in the Northern Cape. We are building the LPG pipeline. We are active in Ghana. It's a minority stake that we have in Ghana in another country, which pays us dividends regularly. It is giving us the dividends regularly. We are active in South Sudan. We are drilling a block that was given to us because we think that the state must have capacity. And that is what we are doing together as a team. It's not a minister's call. It is what we do as a team. Uh, in that process, we commit mistake, we burn our fingers, but we are convinced that we will make it work. Uh, I want to talk to uh, the, the thing you make, uh, Honorable Chairperson, is that uh, you have been here for five years, last five years. You have left one thing there to say with the same minister. <laughs> <laughs> There have been no high turnover of ministers over the last five years. And that is an advantage that we cannot acclaim, but it's an advantage. Uh, Honorable Mailam know when I'm mad, he, he can anticipate that. I know him when he's mischievous. Uh, I can pick it up as he speaks that he is now mischievous because we have been together for five years. So that is the beauty of having five years continuous with the same minister. Uh, there was a question about, I will leave the financial questions to accountants. There are quite a number of CFOs here. I won't venture into that space. I will leave them to deal with that. There was a question about the appointment of Kolile Suzanne. What happened? Now, I'll give you the process that we follow. Whether it is boards, whether it is technocrats in the department, since I came to that department, we follow the same process for everybody. We advertise the post. We allow applications to come. And a team is set, not including the minister, uh, to actually screen and interview and select the, the, the people. That happened in this case. That team do all sorts of things, interviews, psychometric tests, and all those things. And at the end, we take those recommendations to the cabinet, that we are recommending these uh, to the cabinet. We don't uh, recommend one person. We say, these are the three people who are appointable. All three of them, you can appoint anyone in the order of preference, and we give them scorecards. In this case, we appointed uh, Mr. Poya to get there, and there was a big noise around him, big noise. We refused to succumb to that noise. You will have noticed that. We said process must select him. He was subject to vetting, uh, to polygraphy test, and all that. And the report ultimately said, it is negative, he can't be appointed, and we said therefore number two is appropriate. And that number two is called the season. And if you look into the scores, they are very close to one another. There is a third one, if this one was rejected, who could be appointed? Because we put three of them before cabinet, all of them at the same time. We didn't go away and bring season. We said these are the three, appoint this one. When they rejected number one, we said then number two must be taken up, and we took called the season. 
So I thought I must go to those details and explain that. We do that to every position that arises. You will notice that person who would even in boards, in our department, we advertise for boards. Yeah? And get long list of people who apply to serve in the board, and we have a responsibility to balance skills in a board, and we do that thoroughly, and ultimately they come to me as the minister. I have the last look at them. How is this thing? Am I happy with the balance and so forth? And I comment on uh, gender balance, uh, the age spread, the geographical spread. I look into all those things and appoint a board. Uh, that is how we work on appointments. And we think that it is working because up to now, we have not seen a situation where there is failure. You could pick up one or two. I won't tell you which one is a problem now. <laughs> I won't tell you which one is a problem. But when you look into qualifications, even in that one, you find that there is a highly qualified zero who shots on other aspects of operations. That's all. That's how we do it. We continue doing this so because it works for the state, not for me. I'm leaving that. I'm not going to get into the increase from 46,000 to over 400 uh, barrels. Where will the, 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 the feedstock come from? Uh, Petro SA used to drill its own gas. Uh, today it doesn't have the drill rigs, doesn't have them. Next door to Petro say there is a discovery of gas by uh, Total Energies, uh, which is a potential supplier to Petro SA when it is operational. Potential, okay. Potential, because it will require development of infrastructure. Uh, there is Shell gas in the Karoo, the shell gas in the Karoo, which has been proven to be economical, we are waiting for uh, DFFE and water to give us all their regulations so that we leave the moratorium, we start exploiting that gas. So, and we can also import gas. Uh, those are the sources that you can look into if you want feed stock. I'm going to leave the equator holding to people who are operational to talk about it. But it's quite a curious question for me. In its help, I agree with that. I agree with that. And we're committing to help them. We're committing ourselves to help them. We'll work with them. We'll improve them. It must be a proper company. It is working in the continent. We have actually permits in Central African Republic and we're moving to other areas. It must diversify. It must be a genuine mining company with capacity. Uh, measure. How are we doing when we, when will we see results? You see, the problem with uh, uh, predictions uh, is that you do predictions when they don't materialize, people write long articles about you. That you tell, you told lies, uh, you said this thing will work on, in, 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 in June, it is not working, you are a big liar. But all I can say is that the measure we're working on, Ndane uh, Muach started working on that project as a CEO on 1st March. He's hardly a month in there. So if we say, as he walks in, we say, one result in June, we are going to actually create problems for him. He must get in there, draft an operational plan, brings to us, we discuss execution of that plan, then we can start projecting the results. That's how we are going to do. We appointed him. Uh, last week we appointed the board that will work with him. He will not work with the minister, he will work with a board. And together they must come up with a plan. They must come up with an execution plan. And they must actually give us email stones that they will actually be uh, checking as they implement the plan. Because 
a plan is only as good as ability to check milestones that you go through. And we're going to do that with them. We're not going to uh, uh, lower our standards. Uh, fictitious company. Safunu has a fictitious company. The Dufunui Meta Wamuna. The fictitious company. And find out who this person who sold product to a fictitious company. Uh, we are going to follow that through and get that report. Uh, and appreciate who benefited to the, from this fictitious company. Because once you have a fictitious company, there is a beneficiary behind that fictitious company. We need to get those. I can't answer that question. I'm sure maybe people close to it can answer it. Um, ESCOM wanting to move from expensive diesel to gas. That cannot be a problem for us. That can't be a problem for us. What will be a problem for us is when ESCOM comes to us and say, we want to get a wholesale license. Okay? When they come to us and say, we want a wholesale license for diesel, we refuse. Simple reason, rule says we give wholesale licenses to those entities that have customers. And they supply to customers, then we give them wholesale licenses. And ESCOM is not such a, 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 an entity. They can't ask for a wholesale license. They must buy a diesel. If we think that uh, petrol say is expensive, they must buy it from somebody else. Uh, but they will discover that they are not paying more than any other diesel price anywhere in the market. The diesel they bought from SOSA is related to market rates, uh, but we won't give them a wholesale license. They're not a wholesaler. They're a state entity. They must not feel the pain when out of their situation another state entity is making performance better. They must have well appreciate that. That's my own view. The same thing if we get electricity from them. We must not be looking for alternatives. We must want that electricity from ESCOM because it's a state entity. Uh, if they want diesel, they must get it from us because we're trading with diesel and we're a state entity. So this thing of wanting to go going to gas it, 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 there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, let's go to guess where we can. Uh, and those must go to diesel to, to, to guess. I agree with that. They must go to guess whether we like or not, whether it costs petrol uh, any money. So fine, but it's a logical step to take. Um, and that talks to the relationship between Petrosa and ESCOM, uh, Honorable Chairperson. It talks to that we should have a good relationship with both state entities. It's not owned by me, it's not owned by that minister. It's two a state entities. Um, I've touched on the status of South Sudan, what drilling in South Sudan. Uh, I'm sure if you want that the MOAH, you can talk to that. We've given, we've been given a blog, we're drilling there, we're going to be making money uh, because we have a theoretical framework that we've developed, Honorable Chairperson, of saying, most of the time we deploy even the army uh, to, 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 to instill peace in many countries. And once there is peace and there is stability, all other countries, China and everybody, go there and do business with those countries. Our argument is that if we instill peace, let's also engage in, in, in economic activities in those countries. So we've started doing that, uh, not big. We're doing it in Mozambique, we're doing it in South Sudan, we're working in Cannes. And I think we should grow in that area. We're working with uh, Cote d'Ivoire. We're working with a number of countries in the continent. Those are the developments 
of the last five years. Let me go to the, the last question. The, 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 the British example. We have raised an issue which will come to you as our supervisors. <laughs> this issue is going to be smashed back to your court as our supervisors. That NGOs that inhibit development were proposed that they must be registered and they must be declaring their source of income. Because if they don't do that, any board in any country that want to support us progress can use them. Uh, if a, a political party can write to Blinken uh, to interfere with our elections, it can write to anybody to disrupt us in any way. NGOs must actually pay. They must actually register and declare their source of income as we do as political parties. And if there are those rules, it will go a long way in regulating their interference. But on big business, because that was the additional point, uh, I always very careful in dealing with big business, uh, Honorable Chairperson, in that uh, my schooling taught me that the relationship between, say, our party and big business is one of unity and struggle of the opposites. Uh, union struggle of the opposite means that we love and hate one another. Uh, they are necessary for the economic growth. Uh, they hate us for what we stand for, and that's it. It's unity and struggle of the opposites, and we must just maintain that relationship and service it. That's what we do. So I make that distinction deliberately because of my elementary schooling. Thank you very much. Uh, can you add uh, these financial questions that are difficult for me? I, I, I can't add. Uh, I did arithmetic, I didn't do mathematics, so they do that. Uh, thanks very much, Honorable Chen, Honorable uh, Members, for the questions. Uh, thanks, uh, Honorable Minister, for leading us. Uh, what I'm going to do, just for us to have a little bit of order, is really just go alphabetical order in terms of the SEF uh, areas. So I'll start with the um, group CEO from SEF together with the CFO to deal with the questions that were posed. And then I'll go to AE, who's got one question to respond to, uh, Petro SA, and then SFF, uh, Mr. Mwache. I, I think Honorable Minister has dealt with the SNPC question, so perhaps there is no need to really elaborate on that. And colleagues, um, I think questions that have been responded to, uh, let's not, yeah. No, thank you, Chair. I think there were two specific questions to my, addressed to myself. One being one about the insurance company. Yes, we discovered a captive, that uh, on the captive insurance, we, we need to do work in terms of us uh, having more control of it, uh, Chairperson, and we are working on that. Uh, we will report on that as we make progress. Um, secondly, it is the question on the uh, ESCOM and uh, the Petrus A, which uh, Petrus A will come, but it is important for me, I'm linking it to the issue of the multinationals and big business um, that our relationship with, for an example, ESCOM uh, is a healthy one. I must say, I must commend the new CEO of Petrus A in his outlook and how we should work as a state-owned entity wherein one does not basically uh, exist at the expense of the other uh, and how we can make it work better. And you would have noticed if it was not because of such a uh, leadership outlook, indeed we would not have achieved the results that we did both at Petrus A and at AE. So it's a healthy, healthy working relationship in that regard. And now how does it assist this with the challenge that we are uh, seeing that these, we are being elbowed out of the space is that the multinationals, in this case, is an open market, but we argue that 
there needs to be set aside honorable volmarans for the state-owned uh, entities. And we have proven that that model works. We couldn't go back to the National Treasury for uh, bailouts. We traded and we were healthy. So imagine if the same model we were to export it to Transnet, to uh, Defence and other clusters of government. We actually could end up with a situation whereby we are able, instead of asking money from the Treasury, we actually take money to Treasury. And that's a point that we really need to uh, labor on. And we appreciate the fact that we appreciate the importance of that set aside for the state owned. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. The question on net asset value. Uh, firstly, I would like to apologize for the slip up from our side, not including the part of liabilities and um, the net asset value. So on the graph itself, the second line, it's in relation to that net asset value, which the increased from 10.4 billion to 12.4 billion. As, as, as indicated, this is as a result of the net profit that was generated in the main. Slide 19. It's on, this, on slide 19. Yes. However, I need to mention as well that the information on um, uh, liabilities and net as asset value, the full statement on financial position was audited by AG. So it shows that, uh, as indicated, the um, total assets is 35.4 billion, and then the total liabilities recorded at the end of the financial year was 22.7 billion. So giving us a net asset value of 12.6 billion as indicated. But as I indicated, apologies for the <coughs> slip up. And then on the calculation method that was uh, adopted by Petro SA to quantify the rehabilitation provision, uh, I guess the CEO for Petro SA will cover that in depth because there was a movement from the, the method that was used previously to the method that is more aligned to our environment. And then on the question by Honorable Masthaule in relation to aqua investment. We have acquired 25% in aqua and then through the, the SEF Carbon, which is the subsidiary of uh, SEF SOC. And then out of the total 25, 10 is funded through a loan that was that we, was raised with DBSA, there's a 10, 10, 10 uh, percent. So it's additional 10 percent of the, the, the shares that we have acquired in addition to the 15 percent that we advanced the loan for, to Aqua. So there are two parts. Out of the 25 percent, 15 was funded from a loan that came from SEFSOC into SEF Carbon which is, and what we have spent for the financial year is 210 out of that pot. And the second pot is the loan that was raised with, by, from DBSA of 10%. Out of the total loan that was raised, the payment that moved for that particular year is 70 million. And in relation to the, CM, the advanced loan to CMG, the total uh, 30 percent uh, um, shares of Remco that was bought by both CMG and I guess costed 4.1 billion. So each entity acquired additional 15 percent. So at the time of acquisi acquisition there was an agreement that I guess will assist CMG in terms of the, their portion of 15 percent. So meaning that in our books then we have, we were expecting to get, to receive money from that loan that we have advanced on behalf of um, uh, um, CMG. So we have recorded that under the loans receivable. So we're expecting money from CMG 
the total amount of $2 billion for their portion that we have covered during the acquisition. Thank you, Chair. As I indicated, uh, the calculation method for the quantifying the, the decommissioning liability will be um, covered by the acting CFO, I mean CEO of um, Petro SA. Thank you. Okay, Chair, for AE, allow the CFO to take that financial difficult question. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, My name is Pamandam Tetu. I'm the CFO at AE. I'm responding specifically to the question that asked why, why was there a significant increase in employee costs between 22 and 2023. Uh, the context of that, if you look at the revenue line also, it almost doubled. If you look at from 696 to 1.4 billion. <laughs> is it better now? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, just the question that I'm responding to is about the significant increase in employee cost from 2022 to 2023. Uh, it must be understood in the context of a significant increase of a doubling of the revenue number from 696 million to 1.4 billion, which uh, necessitated the need to improve capacity within the company from an employee. So during COVID, there was a bit of slow down challenges in the company and with the ramp up in production there was a need to increase the staff complement which will assist going forward we are working on two key projects to include uh, clay key operationalizing another mine and also uh, expansion of the existing operations uh, which uh, will actually improve even our overall uh, profitability because currently if you look at even with that increase in in revenue, our, our margins are not great. But however, as we move into a better coal quality in the next couple of years, you will see a much better performance uh, uh, overall. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair. I will start with ESCOM. Yes, ESCOM remains a very important uh, relationship that we are managing, contrary to what the media is spinning out. And uh, with regards to ESCOM also transitioning into gas, yes, we definitely welcome that. And we see ourselves playing a complementary role, both from an infrastructure point of view, from a gas supply point of view, as it both has a potential to unlock both the West Coast and the East Coast, talking both to Angelech as well as Horekwa, and also Podrex, that is in East London and any other future developments that ESCOM is considering in, uh, in Quebec, as well as we are watching what is also happening in the northern part of the country, where the, the, the fleet uh, that ESCOM has, that coal fleet, in terms of the new supplements. So we are definitely working with ESCOM, especially in Mosul Bay, because that's also something that supports what we're doing in Mosul Bay. Ghana? I don't think there's much for me to add, just to say that uh, while Scanner is an asset, it is also a company that needs to adhere to governance, so uh, requirements. Uh, the insinuation that you just have a full uh, department or division that's just uh, handling that, that asset, the quantum of that asset and the strategic relevance to the contribution, monetary contribution that it's making to Petro SA, and us using that asset to anchor also us as we navigate the challenges that we are facing with Petro SA going forward and supporting our going concern, it is important. So I think that would answer Ghana. Then it is a fact that on RFP 001, uh, Ikuteza was uh, disqualified. I'm an engineer. If I go uh, for a test to be a chartered accountant, I'm going to fail. Equitesa was awarded RFP 00, Equator Holdings was awarded the RFP 004, which was a funding uh, program, and that's why they qualified. They didn't qualify in RFP 001, they were disqualified. RFP 004, they were qualified. As we indicated earlier, we would be 
more than willing to open all our books to AG when they come. Uh, then, on the, on the insurance issue, um, yes, we do, there is a captive insurance that we are battling with. And that captive insurance uh, is a company uh, that solely services PetroSA, and it also can also service the affiliates of PetroSA in terms of its MOI. That company is under the trust that was developed by the government of South Africa. We as PetroSA, as a beneficiary of that trust, we don't necessarily have control of the, of, of, of the trust, but uh, the government of South Africa, which funded the establishment of that trust, is an area where we are expecting that for, to, to gain control uh, is something that needs to be looked at. And not just only to gain control. Our energy sector, especially in oil and gas, is underserviced. That captive insurance was grown over the years, and our, cap our oil and gas industry here, you have new entrants in the market that uh, come into the space and service. You have a vehicle as a state that you can use to, to service in future into making sure that, that those instruments that are already set uh, are fully utilized to address the requirements of the oil and gas sector. Thank you. Decommissioning liability. Yes, we will continuously be doing adjustments. The adjustments are not going to be major every time. Uh, and what is driving us doing the adjustments, they are technological advancements. Uh, and those technological uh, advancements uh, are optimizing how we decommission. They reduce costs, and th those advancements are also based on real cases. Our first case and our original basis was from a conceptual point of view. And we had done adjustments just from a conceptual point of view. We needed to make sure that we benchmark in terms of in other places, in the other areas in the world where they have decommissioned, what have they done? And what can we learn from it? And what can we incorporate? So that's what we've done. We also are advancing other concepts uh, what, which they're quite at an infancy level right now for us to share, which would help us also to deal with decommissioning because for that real estate and the offshore block in block nine uh, above those wells, there is capacity because you already have network there that you could um, have offshore uh, generation that then supports that real estate, that also supports contribution towards the shortfall that we currently have between what we have and what we're supposed to have. So we will continuously be reviewing that number, uh, but when we review that number, we base it on uh, the cases. We also use accredited institutions that have done this, that have the database uh, that is recognizable, so that we do not, um, we are responsible in adjusting that number. So it is going to be a continuous process uh, from our side. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Th thank you, Chair. Um, I think uh, most of the questions. Sorry, Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I think questions have been dealt with. Uh, there was one question around our aspirational number around the sale of strategic stock. Um, we were aspiring to look at the number around 100, um, but of course um, we've got the old grade of Basra that is not being used by our refineries in the Republic. Um, and we can, we are actually currently looking at that to be able to refund uh, Treasury because it's not useful for our refineries here as strategic stock. Um, and we will actually hopefully 
be able to deal with that in the not so distant future. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Chair, I think there were just two questions <laughs> that I, I missed. Uh, we'll see, oh, there, were, there were two questions that he just needs to come back to on the dormant entities. And uh, I think there was the cobalt investigation that was talked to. And then also, I guess, to talk to Omar. And then I think after that, I'll be able then to hand over back to the minister. Thank you. Very, very fast. No, the domain companies are those companies that either have been winded down or that we have registered for the purpose of uh, special purpose vehicle. For an example, uh, the aqua acquisition would have been through such uh, uh, entities instead of us, because they already registered under SAFE, you know, instead of us closing them down and later on when an opportunity comes, we go and re-register again. We normally keep them but report on them. And the Koboto investigation uh, is basically all the, investiga uh, the affected employees, uh, we've parted ways with them in one way or the other. Uh, either through settlements or other disciplinary, uh, except for one that is still outstanding, and uh, PASA is working on that one, uh, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for the question on, on the OMA and the opportunity to speak a little bit about the transformation of Ramco. So Ramco was formed as a public-private part, uh, partnership with uh, Sassel holding 50% shares, uh, EGAS holding 25% uh, shares on behalf of the South African government, and CMG holding 25% shares on behalf of the Mozambican government. Uh, the company started transporting gas in 2004. It was managed by Sassel under uh, the MSA, which is the Management and Services Agreement. It was also operated and maintained uh, under, by Sassel under the Operations and Maintenance Agreement. Um, these agreements had a three-year uh, uh, renewal uh, process, and uh, up until 2019, over the 15 years, um, this was done almost on an automatic basis. However, Sassel also had an, uh, the responsibility to uh, transform and uh, train and empower the other two companies. And in 2019, when Sassel hadn't shown any um, intention of doing that. Uh, CMG and EGAS voted against the renewal of the MSA and uh, then instituted a process of transformation within Romco. So since then, Romco has become, is, is transforming uh, under a project called Transformer to a standalone company. The MSA, the Management Services Agreement, has now been replaced by a full management team uh, of Romco. So Ronco is uh, managing itself. However, Cecil still continues to operate the company under the operations and maintenance agreement. Nevertheless, we are working on the uh, pr process to actually uh, migrate and exit that, uh, and that will be done over the next few years. So the target here uh, is to have the board imp approved implementation plan uh, for the exit of that uh, operation and maintenance agreement. Thank you very much. That is us. Uh, my few words of gratitude to all of you is that the Amba could see a house in. See a house in. And it's no question, first question is a cool. First question is a room in the house. Okay, honorable members, I know we have uh, not done justice, and I, I want to suggest this process. Molo uh, Susan, Molo. I was was by CEO. Molo Susan, so go back, boy. I'm going to Honourable members, just very few. I know you are true, Honourable Minister. We are way, way out of time. 
and the worst thing is that, uh, honorable members, unfortunately, we did not prepare even a lunch for you. Let me do this very quick. I'm giving you, once you exceed two minutes, this is our last term meeting, not just last meeting, our last term minutes. Just in a minute, your last words. I'll start with Honorable Malinga, Honorable Volmarans. Uh, you can just sit and say thank you, Enkos, from 2019. Honorable Makeke, Honorable um, Mailem, Honorable Mashaule. You can even thank the minister. I can see he's grieving. <laughs> Why you calling on me? No, 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 Chairperson. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Let me say to the team led by the minister, uh, thank you very much for your hard work. We apologize where we stepped on your toes, uh, where we were very brutal. It's part of what we had to do. Uh, we can uh, bear fruits now, Chair. The seventh administration will be Angas uh, Minister Ngobangatuguza Bantabasha Boto. They will Bazo Hambaga Lula Chepesin because we have paved the way. Thank you very much. Keep well. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, Chair, from time to time, uh, politicians get deployed, and when you get where you are deployed, you have to fit in whatever uh, capacity that you are uh, designated to. Uh, in this regard, I've had an, a wonderful op opportunity of working within the DMRE uh, family uh, with all its package, its problems, its uh, good times, its bad times, and uh, we have made uh, quite good acquaintances, and um, the objective was to pave and show the way forward in a positive way for the country. Uh, it's such memories that uh, a person would always um, uh, keep um, in their minds and heart. I thank you for everything that went through. Thanks, Chair. Now we're now we a chairperson on call. Thank you, a chairperson, and good afternoon, uh, my minister and my colleagues, and uh, DG with everyone that is present today. Uh, in fact, Chairperson, um, today's session reminds me of uh, my first day, uh, I think it was in April, when I got in into the room, I think Seth was doing presentation, and, and they were just reporting, you know, how bad things were at that time. But um, I actually, I'm now, you know, impressed that there is a lot of improvement and with all other departments. And uh, I never thought that I will understand what is going on. And, and I've been learning. And I just want to thank all of you. Sometimes if you don't even know the content, you are just new in, in, in this, you know, uh, uh, deployment, you know, uh, my chairperson, you know, in my previous, uh, you know, de 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 deployment, you know, it was not, uh, I, I mean, uh, I was not dealing with minerals and energy. I was dealing with something else. But really, I just want to thank all of you for being patient with some of us that were slow learners, but we are somewhere today. And thank you. And uh, if Kona Basignia Tele Kona chairperson, I sit a circleist. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Oh, well, no, no, no. I'm sorry, uh, Chairperson. In my other life, uh, but now it's my it's my minister. And thank you, Chairperson. And thank you. I just want to thank even my colleagues. You know, they took me through. Sometimes I would even forget to log in. Malinga would just say, "Yay, hey, Ugupuen," and and so forth. But I enjoyed, you know, this journey. Uh, we are coming back, Malinga. Don't stress. Thank you so much, uh, Chairperson Luzip. Thank you, Chairperson. Let me start by thanking the committee staff who have done an absolutely incredible job over the last five years dealing with uh, some very difficult people uh, on the committee. I look at them, I look at myself, Chair. Um, 
But uh, I want to thank them because, because without them we couldn't have done the job that we, we've had to do. I also want to thank the many, many, many officials at the DMRE who have taken questions, who have um, uh, interacted, who have assisted and, and really uh, uh, been of great service to the people of South Africa. I do want to, at the same time, raise a couple of challenges going forward. The first is that we need to, as Parliament, hold the executive, and that includes the minister and the department and the entities, accountable. And that means that, that they need to answer the questions that they get asked. I'll give you an example. Today, I asked specifically about Equator Holdings, and I asked about um, their lack of qualification for RFP 0004. I did not get an answer to that. So I think that we need to actually answer the questions that we are asked and, what, uh, and deal with that appropriately. The second thing is that I would, I would look forward to more collegiality going forward in the next parliament. I, I do think that in many instances things are dismissed based on where they come from rather than what they are. In other words, if I put a proposal on the, on the table, the ANC dismisses it or vice versa, um, just because it comes from somebody else. And I think that we need to, we need to be a little bit more collegial in, in working towards a better South Africa. Lastly, I want to thank the minister who has been, uh, he's been a bone of contention. He's been a thorn in my side. I think I've been a thorn in his side. Um, but he has always been charming and uh, willing to engage. Uh, maybe when we sit across from each other like this, not so much, but certainly when we walk out the door, uh, he's always got a smile on his face and, and has been willing to engage. So thank you, Chair. And, and, and thank you to you for your chairing of these meetings because it really has been um, uh, a well-managed process on the whole uh, for the last five years. So thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe you must revisit Christian so that uh, you sort out your home point ship. <laughs> he needs a site at home. Okay. Honorable Masaule. No, no, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I don't know the others on behalf of who they were speaking. As a whip of the African National Congress, I speak on behalf of the ANC and uh, thank the ministry, not the minister, the ministry led by the minister uh, from the departed Bavelilo uh, Shongwa DM to uh, Dr. Ngabani, would like to thank uh, the role that you have played. We want to thank the department. Uh, from the two DGs that uh, were minerals and energy to the major and have one DG up until we have uh, Ndadimbele as the DG. We want to thank all DDGs, as well as chief directors, who normally participate in these kind of uh, meetings. We also want to thank the chairpersons of boards, the CEOs, CFOs, as well as the boards themselves. Uh, because what is submitted here is normally what comes from the boards at large. But I also want to make a special thanks to the staff of parliament, uh, Ayanda, Ari, Sivu, and uh, Mashudu, uh, Makubalo, as well as King, that you are here, uh, staff from other portfolio committees that assisted us in the public hearings and we want to thank South Africans who participated in, oversight, in our oversight uh, role when we go out there uh, and in public hearings and making submissions to the bills that you all know. Uh, and I want to thank all my colleagues ranging from the opposition parties, the Democratic Alliance, the EFF, the IFP, 
um, the AIC, the ATM, and the PAC. There's a reason why I'm mentioning the, these as only parties that I want to acknowledge because those are the ones who attend our portfolio committee. We may have had our differences, Honorable Mailem. We will have differences definitely even in the next coming seventh parliament. We will be robust about them. We won't look at where the proposals are coming from. We will look at the content of the proposals and the inputs. Agree to them if they are agreeable. Reject them if they are not uh, agreeable. I want to thank uh, all South Africans. And lastly, I want to thank you, Chairperson. At times, it was not an easy uh, task for you to chair, even from the members of the ANC, myself included, when we don't agree with you as the chair of the ANC, of the, of the, of the portfolio committee, as the ANC, we had a responsibility to make sure that uh, we rein in you as well when we needed to do so. Thank you very much. Sure, Minister, on behalf of the whole team, even those who are yes. not here. Yes, uh, I love being a response for all of them. Uh, because I'm old now, uh, I also behave as a father figure uh, in dealing with all of them, including Ayanda. She is protesting here. Now, thank you, Chairperson, to you first for chairing a difficult portfolio committee. This is a quite a difficult portfolio committee. But stories that I have heard about other portfolio committees make me appreciate that this is a good portfolio committee. The, I've heard stories where sometimes the minister and the portfolio don't talk to one another. They walk past each other. Uh, we have not reached that stage. Uh, we talk to one another, we engage, we're upfront, uh, we appreciate that. Let me thank the portfolio committee in its entirety and uh, the team of the DMRE, team DMRE, what a wonderful team. Sometimes very slow on dealing with difficult things. Uh, uh, we're having a session with the DG to deal with that aspect. You can't be slow when you deal with difficult issues. Run with difficult issues, because it is always the case. Uh, when we come back, uh, I don't say if, remember, I say when we come back, uh, we'll continue with the work. Uh, I may not be the minister in this portfolio. Uh, I have rumors that I'm going to be handling women, youth, and people with disabilities. <laughs> I've heard that rumor. Uh, <coughs> it's not me who appoint ministers, but the rumor is, is all over that. I will be dealing with this very important portfolio, and uh, I'm ready for it. Uh, so uh, we'll be together. Thank you very much for the work. Actually, I must tell you that this was five years of schooling for me. Uh, I learned a lot of things from you. Um, I listen sometimes. Sometimes I'm a little bit rough-edged in dealing with things that come my way in a way that is not analyzed properly. Uh, <laughs> so I think you have all accepted that. Uh, I think Mela will meet in the seventh administration. You and me will go to that portfolio. Po <laughs> uh, now we're going to we're going to that portfolio. Two of us, women, youth, and people with disability. <laughs> Thank you very much. I enjoyed the five years. It was quite fulfilling. I'm happy with it. Thank you very much. Honourable members, thank you very much. It's so unfortunate, as I've said. Um, for me, it was just a learning experience, but at the same time, I'm sure I'm much wiser than when I started. Uh, just to say, uh, uh, honourable members, we come from difficult moments. Ne? Uh, at times, uh, those, there are meetings you don't know. Receiving calls, someone telling you, 
you want to run the department? And uh, the response will be, don't tell me how to conduct oversight. So it was part of the learning <laughs> experience. Uh, we finally even ironed uh, Pulo. So we finally ironed out. Uh, Honorable Pulo, uh, Dr. Pulo once said, ah, but Jay, I believe you really don't like me. <laughs> no, it was because we had to do work. My first take is that uh, I thank you very much. When we started, somebody was looking at Ayanda. I said, it's not the first time Ayanda is sitting in this chair. The first meeting of this committee was chaired by her. So there is no surprise that uh, on the last meeting is taking the same chair. Uh, but from being uh, elected as the chairperson of this portfolio committee, I'm very grateful and I'm hoping and believe that I didn't disappoint. Um, I've learned even facilitation skills, by the way, uh, in the due process because of the difficulties you are subjecting me to during the proceedings of the meetings. But uh, I think we've succeeded. Uh, to the South Africans, I hope we did, all of us collectively, our level best. Minister, there's only one thing I can tell you. I always maintain, how did we master this? It's only one thing. When you have got a very strong, effective, focused executive, when you have got a very strong, focused executive management, including the oversight boards, and when you have got a very strong uh, oversight committee, the results will always be like this. Where the problem is, is when all these three are taking things from different directions. We made this, this turnover simply because we agreed on what is good and it's bad for the country. There are many examples if we were to sit here. One of those I always say, when uh, Mr. Moach used to talk about uh, 20 million, ah, that's nothing. When he said, uh, no, it was just a 80 million, that's not a big issue. Then we realized down the line that uh, in the energy space, you, take, you talk billions, not just millions. And we learned a lot on that. Uh, I'm sure when you sit down, Minister, you look at the achievements that this department, obviously not on its own, it was not easy to recover the lost strategic stock, but we did it and it, it was done successfully. So my appreciation is to everyone who has made it possible and wish you all the best uh, that uh, we meet again on the seventh parliament. As the minister said, uh, we may, if we all come back, that will be great, but we may not be in the same area. Thank you very much. That's well appreciated. The meeting stands adjourned until the next term of the seventh parliament. Thank you to the media. Thank you to the media. Thank you very much to the media.